theyeshiva.net. Okay, page 132. The line says, the mm-hmm. So the Moedim Anachnu Loch, right? The Noida Anachnu Loch is Kel Teis Hashem. One perception is Lamata Yesh or Lamayla Ayin. The other perception is Lamayla Yesh or Lamata Ayin. And the two can't seem to uh, agree easily. It's a whole different uh, paradigm. It's a whole different Hashkafas Olam. It's a whole different perspective. And it's not a question of analysis. It's a question of instinct. It's a question of what we would call intuition. Or in German, Spitzenfingergefühl. Spitzenfingergefühl. Spitzen, the gefühl, the feel that you have with the edge of the finger. In other words, not what you don't touch. It's what we call the sixth sense, you know, the Spitzenfingergefühl. Yes. The feel, the, the feel that you can only feel with finger, at the edge of the, the point, finger. The point, the point you know, that it's almost like you can't touch it. It's just barely perceptible. <laughs> barely, yeah, perceptible. It's uh, it's that uh, that hergish, that 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 sense, that certain sixth sense. So the question is not what the person experiences after shiurim and explanations and then learning and his boyninus. It's the very, it's the very perspective. It's the very notion. Vas leik tzachab b'pshitus, and vas leik tzachnishta b'pshitus. Meaning, it's an expression in Yiddish. What, what the person experiences as reality, and what a person experiences ultimately as, as superimposed on reality. So this is the two ways of thinking. It's really two ways of. of it's not. This is not a small difference. It's 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 a. It's, too, it's, a, it's, a, it's a different life. For one, for one, the intangible is, is not reality, and you have to sit a lifetime and convince and argue, yeah, nish, nish. And for the other one, it's the exact opposite. It's the tangible is reality? Like, come. But, you know, you have to prove that reality to me. But, but you can move to the point where then it becomes your yay. Yes, no, of course. And as, as, and as I said, this is not two levels. This these are endless levels because what is in one world ayin becomes in another world yesh. And that's also part of ishtalshilus, right? So g'doyle ma'isat sadikim and ma'isat shemayim v'aretz because ma'isat shemayim v'aretz is from ayin to yesh and ma'isat sadikim is from yesh to ayin. So he says, v'zeu inyin anachnu moidim loch. Yesh Amiti. The real Yesh. But not the, no, the Yesh that we talk about comes from Oilam Atayu. From the breakage of Oilam Atayu comes the Yesh Agashmi, as he said earlier in the Maim. So now, the first brach of benching is Birchus Moshe, which is the Man. Man is Lechem and Ashamayim. Lechem and Ashamayim is the bread that comes from heaven, which is Isarusa, the Le'ela, the arousal from above. That doesn't come from creating a transformation in the earthiness of the world. That's lechem in aretz, which is the second bracha of benching. The first bracha of benching deals with Moshe, Moshe's v'nachnu ma etzem habitul etzem ma, the pnimius of everything, which he associated with the world of akudah. The second bracha is lechem in aretz, which is the transformation of the sparks of toyu, of the the elevation of the kalim of toyu back to their source which is basically confronting the yesh and bringing it back to its source, which is ayin, or in the words of this maimer, to take the sparks of toyu and align them with their original source before they were broken, which then adds so much to tikkun. That's the bracha that Yehoshua introduces, which is the second bracha, lechem in aretz. Here you change from the paradigm of bracha to the paradigm of hoida. When you're in a state of moishu Rabbeinu's bracha, there's no moidim anachnolach. When you come into Lechem and Aretz, over here, everything goes into the world of Haida. Now you're dealing with a Machlaikas. And now you're dealing with the recognition of the Machlaikas. Because that's the point. That itself is very important. That when a person wakes up in the morning, they right away have to know there's an argument. You should just realize there's going to be an argument in your psyche, and there's going to be an argument in your world. And the argument, all arguments, boil down to one argument. And that is, what is Yesh? And what is ayin? I'm not sure there's one machlokus in the world that can't be traced back to that machlokus. What is yesh? 
And what is ayin? Yes, sometimes the machlaikas can become very petty, but if you'll go deep, deep down, you'll psychoanalyze every machlaikas, and you'll suck the marrow out of it, as Jews tend to do, and you'll trace it back to its original source, it's always this machlaikas. If lamayla yesh or lamata ayin, or lamata yesh or lamayla ayin. Huh? Yeah, yeah, ultimately this is the question. This is the question. Even in terms of yourself, who am I? What, what, is, what is the yesh by me? Is my lamayla my yesh and my lamata my ayin or the other way around? My lamata is my yesh by me. Who am I? And my lamayla is ayin. If my lamata is yesh and my lamayla is ayin, I will protect it till the end. And anybody who tries to breach it, I will become very, very aggressive or defensive. <laughs> Or I can see my lamayla as yesh and my lamata as ayin, and then I'm in a different state of mind. So the moment we wake up, we say moidani or hoidul Hashem or in benching when we eat, because it's an ongoing conversation of a person being aware that once you're in touch with lechem and haaretz, there's two perceptions. And those two perceptions I have to confront constantly. And moidim anachnulach means even though I have a different perception, nonetheless, I'm going to allow myself to live and appreciate and be sensitive and allow my antennas to pick up the music of Lamay Layesh or Lamata The Machlaik is, what the definition of Ayin is? Is that It's basically the debate between superficial perceptiveness and, 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 and depth. Yeah. That's the machlekes. So everything is ayin, regardless. Yes, on one level, yeah. I mean, you could say that. Again, ayin doesn't mean the geshem doesn't exist. It just means it's tofel to the ruchni that gives it its whole chios. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It exists. It says, Beresh is baru l'kim as Hashemayim v'saretz. He's not arguing with a pasuk in Chumash. Hashem created heaven and earth. What he means is that... The, 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 the Ruchanis is the Yesh Amiti because it's the Iker HaMahava HaMachaya Lahan Chil Oyeva Yesh and the Gashmis is bottled to the Ayin Betachlis it doesn't assume it doesn't assume uh, that level of validity and significance all Halacha deals with the Geshem if there's no Geshem yeah, I can't tie a knot on Shabbos <laughs> I can't untie a knot on Shabbos yeah? I can't trap an animal on Shabbos it's all, all Halacha deals with Geshem the question is, and Gefilte Fish is also Geshem, yeah. The question is how I define it, how I see it. But after that we say, What's the difference? The difference between Bracha and is, I submit. I confess, I, I submit my position that this is the emes, but it's not begili mamash. That's why it's called moide. I have to be moide to you. It's like you persuade me and I can't argue. But I can't say that this is my initial position. In other words, that it really sits well in me. Bracha is already the next state from hoida. You come to bracha. As we said, bracha is lashon hamshacha, hamavriches hagefen. You bend the vine and you bring it into a new space in the orchard where you take a branch from a vine and you put it under the earth and you bring it up and you allow a new sapling to emerge and ultimately when it develops roots you're going to cut off the branch from its original tree. That's the definition in Mishnayis in Arla. Hamavriches hagefen, as we're learning in Masechet Rosh Hashanah. So bracha is lashon hamshacha, meaning... It's, I'm not just moide to you, but it's actually something that is communicated into me, that the state lamata becomes it's a, a state of complete internalization, I'm not even being moide to you, because it's like it's my position also, moide means the argument is so powerful that I have to submit, like you say I have no choice, you won you won the argument, you won but you won, I lost I lost. I lost the argument. I know I lost the argument. I know you're right. But I know that you're right. Brach is that it's, it's so right that it becomes my very definition of rightness. 
It's not any more a level of submission. It's not a struggle. There's no contention. Ki ha loss mayin nukun ma'isa tzadikim nimshech acha kacham shachas mayin duchrin betoyis v'zgilu yoy me oiras detoyu v'zel mevarchin ki baruch lashon amshach. Because the lechem in the aritz itself accomplishes this. Once a person confronts the yesh and brings it back to the ayin, so the toyu light is now added to the world of tikkun and it infuses it with a new spiritual depth that it didn't have on its own. So therefore, from Haida you reach bracha. The very act of G'dayla Maiset Tzadikim, of dealing with Tayu, he says, the halas man, the feminine waters of Maiset Tzadikim, which represents the fact that the person takes the food, or takes the physical body, or takes the physical universe, and brings it up to a state where it becomes connected to the true yesh, which is what he calls ayin de la'ela, which is yesh amiti. This brings forth mad, mayin duchin, masculine waters, a whole new level of gili that comes from the lights of toyu, which are really much higher than the lights of tikkun. It's just that the lights of toyu disappeared, they departed and the kalim broke. But now when you bring back the netzutzis of toyu to their source, which is called halas mayin, you elevate, halas mayin, you elevate the feminine waters, it brings forth an arousal, of the masculine orgasmic spiritual waters. It brings forth in Isarusa de la Ela that the original lights of Tayu, which are now united with the lights of Tayu that fell down, infuse the Tikkun with a whole new energy, and therefore from Haida you come to Bracha, Lashnam Shach, Alakal Hashem Alakena Anachnu Maidim Lach, Umevarchem Aisach. It starts with Maidim and it continues to Mevarch. So this metaphysical journey, you, you went from, you, you took your, from below, you took your Nitzotas of To, you went up, did you stop at Tikkun, you went higher than Tikkun? Well, you were working with Tikkun. It's the Tikkun model that allows you to elevate these Nitzotas. Like he said, it's always the Adam. The and Adam, the Sheh Ma. you bring them back to? Back to Tikkun, back to Toh, and to back, or back to something by, higher. By, by bringing them back, by bringing them back to themselves, you're bringing them to Toyu, because that's who they are. By revealing the Kedusha in them, you're bringing them to Toyu, because that's who they are. They are fallen sparks of Toyu. They're not Tikkun. So that's not real Ayin. Ayin is higher than Toh. Ayin is the Yesha Miti that's higher than Toh, when is the... No, here we first, Ayin, here the definition of Ayin here is the, 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 the source of everything in Ruchnius. The Ruchni is the source of everything is what he's defining as Ayin. Why is it called Ayin? Not because it doesn't exist, because in our vocabulary, we call it nothingness. But, but somehow we've used Ayin in, in terms of this even higher than Toh, the, where the, the spheres all exist, but they're infinite, but in the, in the real sublime within infinite, subsumed within infinite. Yeah, that, that's, okay. that's yet. So here he's bringing back to Toh, but we're still calling it Ayin. We're calling it Ayin in the sense that it's a Makar HaRuchni. Generally, that which we don't understand, we call nothing, right? Or infinity. When somebody says, what are you feeling? And you say nothing, <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> trouble. No, not trouble. It's like, let's not go there. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's too, it's, it's messy. It's complicated. So how come it's not this to do before, but it's You want to know why we start with Berches Haman? Then with, uh, okay, we'll soon see. So you have two brachas. One is Berches Haman, is Moshe, Hazan, Asa, Olam, Lashen Nister, Lashen Nister, and one is Lashen Gilu, Yinoi, De Lecha, Hashem, Alekeinu, which is the Bechina of Haida. The Maimer now goes off on the next, on the next, into the next realm. After all of this has been explained, basically, the opening discussion was about benching. From this he went into the mindfulness that you need during food. From this he went into the two worlds of Toihu, Shem Ban Beheme versus Tikkun, Shem Ma Adam, and the relationship between Toihu and Tikkun, and the advantage in each, and the problem and the challenge in each, the world of integration versus the world of primal, volatile, infinite extremism of emotion where the world of t- versus the world of tikkun, balance, structure, compromise. And the relationship and elevation of toyu through the Adam of tikkun and what he gains out of it, including Yichya HaAdam, Adam Ha'alya. From there he went into the realm of Lechem and Hashemayim, which comes from Moshe Rabbeinu, discussing the uniqueness of Moshe Rabbeinu, who is Kvat Peh, Kvat Lashen. 
explaining the idea of the Sherish Haman, which is Akudim, beyond Nikudim and Brudim, beyond Toyo and Tikkun. From there he went in to the two brachas of benching, the first and the second, which represent Nikudim versus Brudim. Lechem and, which represent Akudim versus Nikudim and Brudim. The first bracha is the man, and the second bracha is Lechem in Haaretz, and the process of Moidim, because of the machloikas between Lamaila and Lamata, what is Yesh, what is Ayin. After this, Me'at Atzarek Levayr, Inyan HaShabbos. Now we have to start explaining the concept of Shabbos. Kehinek <laughs> How do we type Shabbos? The way the world learns, we grew up, what's Shabbos? Hashem worked for six days, and he rested on the seventh day. So always in first grade or second grade, there was always a child who raised his hand and said, Doesn't Hashem not get exhausted? Why is he resting after six days? What's the problem? Why did he have to rest? So the natural answer is, if you were Zoycha to get an answer, the answer would have been that, you're right, he doesn't get tired, but it's a euphemism. He wanted we should rest on the seventh day, so we say that he stopped creating the world after six days, and he rested, doesn't mean he rested because he was exhausted from the toil and the labor and the exercise, but rested is basically a term to say, that he stopped working, and in our case, we would call it rested. So, I mean, that's the Balabatish's simple understanding of Shabbos. The question then is, but what does it really mean? What's this concept? He created the world for six days, and he stopped on the seventh day. What does it mean? What was the point? We stop because people need a day of vacation. <coughs> get back their thoughts, to get back their emotions. Kivayachal, they need a day of vacation. I'm not sure it relaxes them, or it makes them more miserable. That's already an old question, what vacation does to people, especially Jews. But what is this idea? What is the essence of Shabbos? What is the meaning of it? So he starts explaining. He finished. Which we say in the Shemoneser of Shabbos. Yismach Moshe of Matnas Chalka. V'shomer v'nei Sol Sashabbat Lod V'peini v'nei Oisei Lo'elam In Parshas Kisisa. K'shei Shesham Os Hashem Es Hashemayim V'saretz Uvayim Hashvi Shavaz V'yinofesh. Or another Pesach is in Parshas Bereshis. This is Kisisa. Parshas Bereshis it says. V'yichul Hashemayim V'aretz V'chol Tzvam V'yichal Lekim P'yayim Hashvi Melech Tashirasa Again, he's bringing Rayas that the Torah says, there was a concept of Shavas, of Shvisa, of abstaining, Tashbisu, stopping, resting. What's the meaning? The concept of Shesh Yisamim is no. Shehem Vav Ktsavas. They represent, Vav Ktsavas means six dimensions. Katsa is a dimension. They represent Vav Ktsava, six dimensions. Everything has six dimensions in the sense that there's four sides and then there's the Maila, the high, the top and the bottom. But what we mean here, six, is not just physically. Six directions. What we mean is Pchines Za. The reason there's six directions physically is because spiritually there's six directions. And they're known as Za'ir Ampin or also as Midas Datsilas. The six midas of the world of Atzilus, Chesed, Gvur, Teferis, Netzach, Chod, Yisrael, each direction represents another mida, And that's why there are six directions. You have Maile, you have Mati, you have Mizrach, you have Mairev, you have Dorim, Tzofen. For example, Dorim is Chesed, South is Chesed. Vayelech, Avram, Holech, Venasoya, Hanegba, Dorim, South, Chesed. You have Tzofen, the North is Gvur. And in fact, in Sifrei Kabbalah and Sifrei Chesedas, they discuss the climates in the North Pole and in the South Pole, based on the Midas of Chesed versus Gvura. Mizrach is Teferes, the East, and then you have Netzach, Hoid Yisoyed. So basically, uh, uh, you have Dorim Tzofen, Mizrach, Netzach and Hoid is Maile Mata, and then you have uh, Yisoyed is Dachzach Mairev. Yeah, that's what it is. So you have the Sheish Ktsavis, the Vav Ktsavis. Malchus is, is not, Malchus is a separate Indian. Malchus is either space itself or whatever it is. But you have it, the Vav Ktsavis, connected what's called Zah, the small face, which are Midas of Atzus. What's Negeya here? 
שבכל יום נמשך המשך המיוחדת מבחינת זה רמפן, על ידי בחינת מלכוס דאצלס. When you speak about six days, it's not just days. Each day represents one of the Vav Ktsavas, one of the Midas. Each day there was a communication of divine energy via one of the Midas. A special Hamshacher from Zah, again Zah, the six Midas, through Malchus. Hainu, b'yoy Malaf Midas HaChesed, b'yoy Beis Midas HaGvura. All L'Tzayr Chishav was B'ri Yitzir HaAsiyah, B'Bchines Balei Gvul, it was all in order that they should be able to emerge, the three worlds, creation, formation, and action, as finite universes. And the light evolves with restrictions. One antecedent after another antecedent, one cause after another cause. With vessels, many, many diverse vessels, quoting the Megillah. Until what can emerge is a truly finite creature which is truly finite. No semblance of infinity at all. Because the Ratzin, the will of the Matzil, Matzil here, he doesn't say Boire. Matzil is the one who made Atzilus, in other words, even before Bria. The Ratzin of the Matzil, the one who emanated the world of Atzilus was to have a Dira, a home, a dwelling place, in the lowest elements of reality. So when we speak about the six days of creation, it's not just Sunday through Friday. Six days are also metaphors of six types of hamshachas of divine energy. On Sunday, the Rebbeinah Shalolim, so to speak, identified within his infinity, Midas HaChesed. And the energy that flows on Sunday is the energy of Chesed. And all the creations of Sunday represent Chesed. The creations of Monday, Gvura. The creations of Tuesday, Teferis. The creations of Wednesday, Netzach. If you go through my Sibiratius, each creation, each day is representative of a particular type of energy and therefore type of creature. The Ramban then adds that each one of the six days represents also a millennium, a thousand years. The 12 hours of the night is the first 500 years and the 12 hours of the day the next 500 years. And as the Balatanya says elsewhere, if you study history you will see that the first millennium represents the first Midah. The second millennium represents the second Midah. Gvura, the third millennium, the third. Now, of course, everything is integrated, so it's not like you have one dimension in history. But in each millennium, there are major universal events that represent either Chesed, Gvura, Teferis, Netzachot. We are now the year 5777, which is the sixth millennium, which is Friday. We're already after 500 years in the sixth millennium. So it's already Friday morning. The year Hey Alafim Tov Kuf was Friday morning. The Rechaim says this in Parshish Tzav. He says, Hey, I love him, Tov Kuf. It's Friday morning, Erev Shabbos, 1740. That's Friday morning, Erev Shabbos. Six years, interestingly, six years after the Baal Shem Tov was revealed. Five years, for example, before the Balatanya was born. Hey, I love him, Tov Kuf. That was the years of the great revelation of Teres Achsidus, Friday morning. Tov Shinun, that's Friday, that's Friday morning, 5,500, yeah? Tov Shinun, 5,750, 5, is Friday midday, 250 years later. Because 1,000 years is a day, 500 years is 12 hours, 250 years is 6 hours. Friday, Chatzais, is Tov Shinun, 5,750, Tov Shinun is Friday midday. Now... Five seven 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 is ready fri late, late Friday afternoon with all the chaos in a Yiddish house that happens Friday afternoon. Tayameha, yeah, Tayameha, yeah. It's an ishpashat. It's brought that uh, the reason that Torah's uh, Achsidus was revealed then is because there's a mitzvah to eat out of Shabbos, the Tafshilim of Shabbos, and since Pnimi is the Rashi says in Shira Shirim that Pnimi is a Torah's Torah, the Torah's Agoula. Tired of Mashiach, so Friday afternoon, you taste it. What are the reasons that's brought? It's brought in Sifri Chsidis. I'll call upon them. So, what do we have? We, so, so, so this, 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 this millennium is Midas Hayasoid. This millennium is Midas Hayasoid, yeah. Midas Hayasoid. Yasoid is bonding. What are, what are the six directions, north, east, west, south, and all the other top and down? My Lamata, up and down. Like the Nanuyim of Lulav. The Nanuyim of Lulav. In space, 
if you just go into outer space where there's no land, right? right. There's, there's, isn't there only four? Or if you go up and down, you have six. Like the lulav, you do the lulav, you know. Right. Four right. directions, up and down. Lamandas <laughs> kolam Yeah. Outside the box. If you're in space, from imaginary we're seconds away from Revelation. I'm okay. sure it's coming in. Have a box. Your side is associated with the bris. No, Directions. I would say that one of the cardinal directions are up and down. So, you, you mentioned you identified. Might have, I think. Might have. I, I, I thought you said that Myra was Netzah. I'm sorry. That no, Netzah Chayd, and you said this might have. I'm almost sure. Yeah, okay. I have to look it up, but I think so, yeah. Well, so would be West. West would be Yisoy. Right. Right. Yisoy generally is associated with bonding. His Kashras, the Bris, which is the ability to be able to create new generations. You see also in our generation, the computer revolution, and especially the internet revolution, what it accomplished was, it turned the world into a bedroom. It's Midas HaYisait. It's the Midas to be able to unite the whole world. Now, like every Midas, it could be used in an extremely positive way. It could be used in destructive ways. But Midas HaYisait generally is that in this millennium, you had Sila Toiv, Sila Mutiv individuals who impacted the entire world, either negatively or positively. Mass murderers that you had in this millennium that had an impact on tens of millions of people in a negative way, in a destructive way, and therefore the potential is also in the positive way. That's all a product of uh, our millennium. And also in the positive things, in the positive sense, different factors that allow the world to become a unified, integrated place. Mom, it's like a bedroom. Talk about radio. We, we take these things for granted today. Radio, television, satellite, computers, internet, v'chuli, v'chuli. These are all components of Midas HaYisoyed, which all point to one idea, and that is every development in history is really divine energy. It's a divine conversation with humanity. You have to pick up on it. You have to have antennas to pick up on it. And that's why there are three very different approaches, for example, to technology that you'll see in the Jewish world. One approach is treif, treif, treif. Chadosh asam in anything that my mother didn't do, my grandmother didn't do, is automatically not Jewish. It's treif. Somehow, you find a tatum for certain things, but the definition is new things are treif. Another approach is, on the contrary, everything new is embraced b'chalatoykev. The truth is that the real, ma- the real, the toichen that he's conveying here is that every development in history is essentially a divine opportunity. To ignore it, you're ignoring a gift that was given to that generation. But when you don't ignore it, you have to understand that its purpose is to be able to be used. Kol mashabara kadosh baruch hu lamai to be able to be used for, 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 for Kvayt Shammai. So therefore, you have in every single day of my Shashis and Mebereshis is an expression of a particular energy that was projected and results already in Atzillus. And then through Malchus, the Atzillus, it comes into Bria and Yitzir and Asiya until it creates the finite creatures of that particular day. Why does it create the finite creatures of that particular day? Because... It's a product of those midas. So, for example, on Wednesday, you'll have Yehima Oedes Berekiyah you'll have the galaxies, the heavenly galaxies, represent the mida of Atzillus that was Nimshach that day. And then it comes out into physical properties in this world in the whole process of evolution. Va'inyin muvan al derech mashal, to explain this, let's give a mashal. May Adam sheroitze lahalas eizah seichel amok al A writer who has a very profound idea, and he wants to put it on paper. But it's not a simple thing to write. It's a seichel amuk. He nay, what do you do? Any writers here? Any people who struggle with writing? It's not an easy thing. You have an idea, and you're excited about it, and now you have to put it on paper. So what happens? He nay tzarich, he nay oir ha-skala, tzarich leider de l'ishtal shal derech tzimtzumim rabim. To get the idea onto paper, the light of the Haskalah, the energy of the Seichel has to go through 
many channels that will challenge it, they will restrict it. For example, it has to go through derech chachmo bina. From an idea, it has to go, which is chachma, it has to go to bina, which is the development of the idea. Or me chachma le bina le midis. From chachma and bina, the person has to get excited about the idea. Chuli, he skips here. What's chuli? It has to go to machshava. He has to think about it. It has to go through a process of thinking about it in a way that you're ready to write it down. Ad Until the idea could go through the power of motion in your hand, which is limited with letters of writing. All the hand knows when you, the finger the finger asks your brain, "What do you want me to write? Tell me what you want me to write." The brain says, "Oh, this is an amazing idea." The finger says, you want me just to write, it's an amazing idea, you want me to write the idea. If you want me to write the idea, you have to let this idea be channeled. That's why you'll see that when a person has to write something, it's very, very powerful, because without it, you don't have it. Until you don't write something, you have it, it's nebulous, it's exciting. When you have to write it, that's when it's communicated, in a very real way for yourself. Reb Chaim Brisker once said, it's a felton azbara, felton havana. Sometimes the person says, Ich kenne ich maas bezein. No, 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 no. Du verstehst nicht. <laughs> I, I can't explain it to you. Because you don't really understand. You understand it on a certain level. You're excited about it. If you understand it, you can explain it. Okay, of course there's a person who has a chush in one thing more than a chush. Some people don't have a chush aksav, yeah? Some of Yosef Zevin writes in a Sefer Yishim Beshittas, he says it's, he's, he's saddened about the Rekha So the Rekha Chovigon, when he opened his mouth, a child can understand. When he writes something... Unless you're a Bucky and Shas, you're Shainam, Achreinam, you're Shalmi, backwards and forwards, like Asher, you can't understand a word he's saying. Not a word he's saying. Not a word. He's, he's a Kvad Peh, not in Peh. Kvad, <laughs> kvad Loshin and Ksav. He says in Peh, he says children. The Rekhachava was, was one of the greatest Goinim who ever lived. He was like a unique mind. This is a unique mind, unique methodology. I mean, he, he like studies Torah in a different way. It's like, whoa. It's, like, it's not a, it's a deeper mind, it's a different mahalach. It's like a whole different, it's like a different planet, his way of, of, of understanding Torah. So Rav Zevin, Rav Shemir Zevin, he knew him. He says when he, he passed away in 1936, Tainas Esther, he says when he spoke, children understood. And he was Michal, he behaved in a very simple way. He didn't have any shtik to He was like a, he was a vilde a little bit. He was uh, chaotic, but he was like very tzugalaz, and he was no, uh, he had no, uh, what's the word? No, no, ears, no, no ears, ears to him, no ears about him. No formalities yet. But he says when he writes, it's impossible. It's mummish. It's the Kachovas, you have a paragraph, you see that there's precious gems there, and it's very frustrating. It's very, very frustrating. It's all the fakir what he's saying here. The writing of a concretized. No, that was the reason. No, but he didn't want to go through those tzimtzumen. He did not want to go through those tzimtzumen. That's, that's also both. It's both. Yeah, it's both. It's both. It's both. So in some people, you have to say, if you can't write it down, you didn't get it. But sometimes a person says, I'm not going there. The writing takes a tremendous amount. You have to compress it, especially nice writing. Uh, prose and... and, and uh, even not poetry, you're readable, a nice flow, you know, how you, no run-on sentences. Also in speaking, you repeat yourself. In writing, if you start repeating yourself, it's not, it's not legible. You can't read it. So it's, it takes a lot of tzimtzum. So the Rakesh Shavis Teres was not to go through its tzimtzum. Yes. And the risk it was basically not to write much. I mean, they yes, very, yeah, very much yeah. Reb Chaim didn't want to write, and when he wrote Chidush Reb Chaim Alevi, he rewrote and rewrote and rewrote. And Michal, they were very against writing and printing the Briskera for years. You had to have stencils, you know, you had to be in the Briskera Yeshiva to get the, the Torahs and this. Why? Because they felt that with writing, it's, it's, you don't have the full, you have the symptoms, so to speak, so therefore you don't have the full, the full Hasbara and so forth. The real poetry yeah. is, is, is just without all the, the filters, it's just the yes. same things, and that's it. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, no, he means that if you're excited about it, you feel you should write about it, you have to have a... If you're excited about it, if you're excited about your message, like, you think it's worth sharing with the world. A lot of people stop writing because they say, eh, well, it's not not a shkaiten. You have to have a feeling that it's worth sharing with the world, or at least with yourself. This is just one mosh. Now we see after you finish your malacha. So you're sitting. Now this is a person who wrote. He wrote a whole shulchan aruch. 
So you know what it means to sit 10 hours and write? And when you're writing, the level of concentration, the flow, the adrenaline from your deepest space in your mind all the way down to paper is very, in- very intense. And now you're done. So nachma malachta, you relax. What happens? Chayzrim kol ha'oydes v'kol ha'koyches asher ha'yinim shachim b'yishtal shalaz derech ilu v'alu v'yesh lem ali elias nechlalim b'koyach ha'seichel ba'atzmas ha'nefesh What happens now is all your lights, all your koyches that went outward now all come back. And they go all back in and they go back to their original source in your own seichel and in your atzmas ha'nefesh. He's giving here a marshal of ksav. The same marshal he gives, for example, somewhere else when it comes to physical labor, which may be more tangible for some of us. If you're playing basketball for four hours and you're running and the schwitzed and the schwitzed and, and you're, you're in that mode, or you're mopping a floor for three hours, or you're in construction, you're schlepping and you're building and you're working. And all, but this is not the tzimtzumim of koyach haseichel, but it's also tzimtzumim. All your energy has to be directed into that particular sport or labor, whatever type of labor it is. And then you're done. And you come home and you plop down on the couch. What's that moment? What happens? You reclaim yourself. All the energy that was being projected outward into the mop or into the ball or into the painting. A, paint, a painter. I know there's an artist here. You paint. Sometimes you sit paint for six, seven hours. And again, it's your energy going into the canvas. And now you sit down... What are you doing? Your whole creative power, where does it go? It doesn't disappear. It goes from the canvas, it goes back into you. Where does it go back into you? Into its original source. That's what he's saying. The oiris and the koiches that were going down through a whole ishtal shulus, they now have an aliyah. The same, the same wow. Yeah. So to speak, goes the way back. It's like a, makes a U-turn and it comes back. That's the rejuvenation moment. Yes, recharge. Yeah, recharge. It's, it's recharge, recharge. It says, says, Kachal derech moshal. This is a moshal. Sheish is yamim asa. Bebchines is tal shalos. Derech ilav alul beribu revavis madregas adoyla mashafal agashmi yazesh yad yose tachten bemadreg. Now we'll understand what Shabbos is. Shabbos is not a pistam, it's a joke. Hashem worked for six days and then he says, in order to give you vacation, I'm going to make believe I'm on vacation. No, no, no. Shabbos is something happened on Shabbos. During the six days, there was a shtal shalos, the evolution of divine energy was going downwards, myriads and myriads and myriads of levels throughout the whole shtal shalos until this world. Because remember, creation doesn't only happen here. It happens in the next world and in a higher world and a higher world, all the way up. Every mida during the sheish yamim evolved and assumed various incarnations until it assumes its ultimate physical incarnation in Gashmi is down here. All the lights, all the divine energy that went outwards come back and they go into the Klal. They go into the Koyach HaKloli, the Koyach of the Klal. Kisham Milo Mata Shavin. Where higher and lower are uniform, they all go back to the source, which is the all encompassing divine power, which is undefined. It's pashat batachlus apshitas. It's not defined by one mid or another mid. It goes back into the source, into the core, just like by the person. You're focusing completely in a very particular way. I'm writing now. When you write about something, you can't think about other things. You have to completely focus on this sentence. There's nothing else going on. This becomes the whole world. When it comes back into you, it doesn't go into a separate chamber. All the koiches go into where? Into you. Into that source of all your creativity. All this koich that you put into the ksav, or you put into any other malachi you're doing, it goes back into the source the koyach haklali, the all-encompassing source of self from which all these powers came out. That's what happens Shabbos. So the nimshal here will be the chesed of Sunday and the Monday of the right. Monday, all coming back yes. to the ultimate. Yes, the chesed, gvura, teferes, netzach, hoid, yisoy, the six days of creation, which basically resulted in the whole entire world. It all comes back. But here, you have to remember one detail, and that is this. When I'm an artist, and I finish painting... What happens? I'm painting for seven hours. And I'm like, okay, enough for today. Right? Or I'm like, wow, this was amazing. I sit down on the couch. 
What happens to the painting? It remains on the wall. It remains on the desk with all the colors. In fact, tomorrow maybe I'll be able to sell it. Or if I'm not a recognized artist, it may take 200 years. But one day somebody will sell it for $20 million. You finish playing the basketball with the basketball. You sit down. You take your water. And the basketball remains in the hoop or under the hoop or above the hoop or stuck somewhere in the fence or somewhere on the field. You finish whatever labor you're doing, running, sewing, building, organizing, writing, speaking, teaching. You finish, you go back, and the words were said. And the letters are on the paper. You wrote a poem, you wrote a book, you wrote an article, you wrote an essay, you wrote an email. It's all there and it remains there. Why? Because, let's remember, the energy created the art, but the canvas and the pigment was independent of the artist. The ink and the quill and the paper is independent of the writer. But what happens on Shabbos? What happens on Shabbos? The world that is created is divine energy. So when the divine energy comes back, what comes back with it? The whole world comes back with it. When the artist sits down, when the writer sits down and reclaims his energy, so the whole universe comes back. So that's why some of you heard your whole life that Shabbos is Aliyah Sa'ilamus. Right? Aliyah Sa'ilamus. The worlds go up. Okay, why not? What else? Mitzray Shabbos. Aliyah Sa'ilamus is a very, very profound description. Aliyah Sa'ilamus is... The world exists on Shabbos, but it's a different world. What is it? It's not anymore the projected world. It's the intimate world. So let's define what's Shabbos. Shabbos, the world exists, but Shabbos, the world is not God's word. Shabbos, the world is God's thought. It's a different experience. Yeah. All the Lama Tes Malachis of Shabbos are based on this. The Lama Tes Malachis of Shabbos are a violation of this state of consciousness that the world is God's thought, not God's word. On the, week, the weekdays, you treat the world as God's word. You have to treat it as God's word, as his projective energy, outward. On Shabbos, as the writer sits down and all the midas, all the koiches go back into his etzim anefesh, which in the marshal, that's the idea of Vayoy Mashvi, Shavas, Vayinofash. What's Vayinofash? Vayinofash means it goes back into his nefesh, goes back into his soul. That's how he touches Vayinofash. So the whole world goes back. So now the world still exists, but where does it exist? It exists inside of him. Like the art, when you come back, that whole article, that whole book you wrote, now it's come back into you. But in the Gashmis, the book stays a book. Here, the book comes with you. So the whole world now is a different world. That's why we say Shabbos, the world is holy. What do you mean the world? What's a joke? Why, what makes the world holy? What makes the world holy? The house is holy. The person is holy. Vos epis. What's Pshat? Because the universe is a different energy on Shabbos. When you light those candles, when the sun of Friday sets on the horizon, those who have a sensitivity know it's a different world. It's, not the, sa- it's the same world, but it's a different world. The tree is a different tree. The bird is a different bird. Why? It's still divine, but it's, it's within God. It's, 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 div- it's divine thought. You know the Maisim, it with the Rishonah. Ah. Shabbos is a privilege. So violation of Shabbos, Chilu Shabbos, is not like Metarnished. You're not allowed to. Because it's a day of torture. No, no, no. It's how could you? How could you? You have to sit with the energy. You have to be in tune with it. And if not, you're really, you're violating something very powerful. Very, very... Now, if you look, all the Lama Tes Malachas is basically a study of this idea in Halacha. Shulchan Aruch Hilchus Shabbos. Which, as you know, Hilchus Shabbos are very, very complicated. And I would say... If you don't really understand the essence of Shabbos, it becomes even a little strange. Like, really, God? You really care if I take out the onion from the, from, from the salad? I mean, mamish like skilla? I mean, could we relax just a little bit? A knot? Untying a knot? You squeeze that, you squeeze that a grapefruit? I mean, so, you know, with a babet I mean, the, the, you know, the tnoyim and the conditions, but psikreshes, metayna meskavim, metayna meskavim, metayna meskavim, it's like, whoa! 
So when you're in that world, you're in that world. You know, sometimes when you have an opportunity, it's always good for Jews to have interaction with people who don't come from their own world because it allows them to uh, revisit, you know, who they are from a more authentic perspective. It's like, it's really very, very fascinating universe, but one, what, what is the essence of it all? The essence of it all is all the Lama Tas Malachas essentially are betraying this reality that exists on Shabbos. I'll just give one example. I'm going to give many. I'll give an example of uh, of, an, of a knot, making a knot on Shabbos, okay? <laughs> What's the problem with making a knot on Shabbos? So you'll say, because in the Mishkan they used to make knots, because they had to build nets. They used to make knots. Clear. But what's the real problem of making a knot on Shabbos? I don't mean I don't mean what the real problem is. I mean what's the what's the, the the essence of it? The essence of it. What is what is what is a knot? What does a knot do? What does a knot do? Why do you make a knot? Because you have two things that are detached, and you want to bring them together, so you make a knot. So what does a knot recognize? A knot says, yeah, that two things are disconnected. So that's why we have to connect them. That's a violation of Shabbos. But because on Shabbos, when everything is in God's mind, in God's thoughts, there's complete harmony. You should be able to unfire them. There's complete harmony. <laughs> there, is no, there is no knot. There is no knot. The, the same is true tiltal from Rishul Sayyachet to Rishul Sarabim. All these concepts which represent the changes you're making on Shabbos, take for example, kneading on Shabbos. What's kneading? You take particles of flour and you mix them with water and you make them into a gush echot, right? On Shabbos, the world is essentially a gush echot. Essentially one entity. It's essentially cohesive. Artificial connecting something, artificially connecting something, it would be like you tell your wife, I love you so much. She says, okay, so how are you going to express it? So you take a rope, yeah? And you tie, <laughs> you tie yourself, to, <laughs> or you put yourself together in one pot. <laughs> yeah. So, so, what? No, we're connected. So let, let's take a rope and connect ourselves to each other. Yeah. It's abs- why? It, it's it, that, <laughs> it's not how you express unity. Why not? Because the unity is internal. So you don't express that type of unity through taking particles of flour and mixing water into them and kneading. That's an external unity which denies the essential unity that Shabbos represents. The Kayyotz represent the different Malachas. Can we get the Maishas with the Rishnah? Yeah. 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 The, 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 there's two Maishas with the Rishnah. They both, they both convey the same idea. One is when he was a child and one was when he was later. When he was a child, he was learning Masech to Shabbos in Cheder. They were learning Shabbos with a Daf Samach Tes. The Gemara says there, Hoya Mahalach B'Midbar. You went in a desert and you lost your count, your, your, your count of time. And you don't know when Shabbos is. There's a shaila in the Mefarshim why he didn't take a cell phone to be able to see the calendar. Okay, that's a, that's a discussion among the, among the various murders. So yes, when the battery died, and others say that they confiscated it. Whatever, but whatever the reason was, he didn't have he didn't have a phone, so he didn't know when Shabbos is. So it's a machlekes in Gemara. What you do? Are you familiar? If you have to count six days and then you keep Shabbos, so you make Shabbos, then you count six days. It's an interesting situation. So the Rishna was learning. So he lifts up, he raises his hand, and he tells his Malamed, I don't understand. He explains it again. The guy got lost, he doesn't know. He says, how do you not know when Shabbos is? He says, Megita Kuk. Megita Kuk of Himmel. Is that when Shabbos is? You take a look at the heavens and you see when Shabbos is. So the teacher knew that this boy is going to be already a different type of boy. When he was an adult, he was already from the biggest rabbis, the Heli Kedruj of Yisrael of Rizhin. Came from the city of Rizhin. He's known as the Heli Kedrujina. But Samach Tzedek, who was the grandson of the Balatanya, had a very deep yididus with him, a deep closeness with him. So he wanted, Samach Tzedek had a big chassid, a big talmud. He was a gon He was the rav of a city called Hamil. Hamil. Hamil, Gomel, the Russians say Gomel. Uh, it's in the Ukraine, in the That's Ukraine. So huh? He was the Rav of Hummel, Reb Yitzchak Isaac Halevi Epstein. They called him Reb Isaac Hummeler. Reb Isaac Hummeler, Reb Yitzchak Isaac was his name. He was a Talmud of the Balatanya and of the Mittler Rebbe, the Tzamech Tzedek. Reb Isaac Hummeler was sent by the Tzamech Tzedek to go visit the Ruzhina to discuss something important for Russian Jewry. It was a shlichus of the Tzamech Tzedek. So he went to the Ruzhina, he came there on Friday. 
So he went in, he said, Gabbai, what he's here for, he comes from the Tzamech Tzedek. And Rabbi Isaac Hamel himself was a big, he was a giant, he was a very big person. And he, st- he sat, stood hours with the Rishonim discussing issues of politics in Russia. In Russia. And he said that over the story, he said he was thinking to himself, they say that the Rishonim is a Kaddish Ali and a Tzadik Yisraeli but he doesn't feel in the conversation that he's so... Uh, it was like what they call in Yiddish, the expression, Chavalap. It was more like, you know, a Chavrusa, like friend. He was just thinking to himself. Anyway, it gets a little, it gets the afternoon. And the Shamish comes in and says, Rebbe Bald is and soon as candle lighting. The Rishonah doesn't, doesn't reply. He continues the conversation about politics. The Shamish comes in, he says, it's a few minutes to, to candle lighting. And he says, ah, I was a my maktas and ktoiris. In the base hamikdash, in the afternoon, every day, they would maktik ktoiris, they would burn incense. So he takes out his pipe, it's called a lulka, and he lights up the, the tobacco. And he starts, he starts snuffing, he starts smoking the pipe. So daf maktas and ktoiris, which he used to do. He used to do in the morning, he used to do in the afternoon. Rabbi Eisel was wondering, before Shabbos, you know, people get anxious, they're nervous, they have to run here, they have to run there, zitz, smoking his pipe as though it's a, you know, Sunday afternoon on a hammock with, 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 with endless hours, nothing to do, you know, snow outside, no work for three days. He's just wondering, and he's continuing to talk. The Shamash comes in and says, Rebbe, it's Hadlokas Aneris. So he stops, he puts down the pipe, and he says to Rabbi Eisel, he says, no, it's time to accept Shabbos. Puts out the pipe. And he turns to him. He was, uh, he was from Russia, the Bible. So he says, Raisa Shirov, come, love a on Shabbos Tazama. Russian rabbi, let us come welcome Shabbos together. And the original stands up and he says, Lom again some fence. Let's go to the window and welcome the Shabbos. So they go to the window. And Rabbi Isaac says, the Rishonah looks out the window. And the sun is about to set. It's soon going to be Shkia. And he said these words. He said, <laughs> He went up higher and higher. And I remained here below. He said, and I saw that there was a difference between me and him. I saw that there was a difference between me and him. So sometimes people who don't experience the real reality, need all the preparations, because they want something. When you're in the real reality, the transition can happen in a moment, because you're there, you're there. You're not, you don't have to get into the mood, you, know, you have to get into the mood when there's no mood, you know? <laughs> let's get into the mood, let's get into the this, let's get into the that, let's create energy. When you have to create energy, you have to create energy. When you're in touch with energy, you have to create anything, you're there, you're there. Sometimes you're just in, you're there. So, it's both stories about the same person, but they really bring out, bring out the same idea. So what happens on Shabbos is, it's not the word Hashem was tired, so he's not tired. So it's just a fake idea that he rests, he rests. No. Shabbos, there's a transformation. In the very universe, there's a transformation. What's a transformation? <clears throat> that all the koiches, all the iris, go b'dere chaliyah. And since they go b'dere chaliyah, they go into the Koyach HaKlali, they become one with Hashem. So therefore, when you light Shabbos candles, when you welcome Shabbos, you look at everything, now there's a oneness. There's no Rishus HaYachid, Rishus HaRabim, essentially, in other words. There's no, um, there's no distinctions, there's no element of, of disharmony. There's complete integration from the Shabbos perspective. That's the Pshat, Alter Rebbe says, there's a Medrash, famous Medrash in Parshas, uh, where is it, Parshas B'Shalach. Shal turnus rufus as Rabbi Akiva. Hashem keeps Torah? He says, yeah. So he says, how does it rain on Shabbos? You're allowed to promote planting on Shabbos? Zoreya. How does he blow winds on Shabbos and the leaves go from here to there? You're allowed to carry on Shabbos? How does he make things grow on Shabbos? How does he make fires on Shabbos? All these things. How does he kill on Shabbos? All the Avas Malachas he violates. So Rabbi Akiva said, are you allowed to carry something in your own house? He said, yeah. He says, Kol ha'olam rishus ha'yachid shal ha'kadosh baruch hu. So Mela, he's allowed to carry. That's what, that's what the Bakiva says. As the Alter Rebbe, that only answers one malacha. There are another 38 malachas. You're not allowed to do in your own house. You're not allowed to cook in your own house. You're not allowed to make a fire in your own house. You're not allowed to plant in your own house. 
You're not going to plant in your own garden? Rosh Hashanah answers, Hashem could carry on Shabbos, fine. He has a big native. He made a native, and uh, even in Borough Park he could carry. But, uh, but there's still another 38 malachas? Starke Shaila, no? The Pshat is, Taisvis asks him, Masech the Shabbos, Yitzhiyas HaShabbos, Taim Shenar Befnim, the opening mission of Masech the Shabbos is, Yitzhiyas HaShabbos, you're not allowed to carry. Frek Taisvis, Hamoitzim Yerushus Lerushus is the last one of the Lamatas Malachas. Why is that the first mission of Shabbos? It should be at the end. In Perik Zion of Shabbos, where he listed 39 Malachas, the last one is carrying. So Taisvis answers, because I saw Malacha Gruyahi. Carrying is an inferior malach. doesn't look like a malach. You're not really doing anything. When you bake, you're creating a change. When you write, you're creating a change. When you shech, you're creating a change. When you sew, when you carry, you didn't do anything. You take a cup from here to here. So it's malach grua. So that's why you start off. The Rebbe explains, because Yitzhiyah HaShabbos, that is Shabbos. All the Lama Tes Malachas, by, by definition, are all a form of Moitzi Mirishus L'Rishus. All the Lama Tes Malachas basically represent taking things out from Rishus HaYochit and bringing them into Rishus HaRab. Taking the world out of a reality where it's in a private domain of Hashem and bringing it into a world of multiplicity where it's a public domain. In one way or another, each of them, their pnimi is, the keruchni is, the ketoichen is, moitzimir shus Basically taking things out of the realm of the boire oilam, the pashtus, because the whole idea of Shabbos is that the world is God's world. That's the whole idea of Shabbos. So any malacha is taking things out of Rishus Hayachan into Rishus Harab. That's generally all the malacha. Specifically, the toichen of every malacha is not recognizing the fact that the world and we are intimately one with God in a very peaceful, harmonious, and integrated, holistic way. So therefore, once it's Rishus HaYachit, the problem of Malachi is gone. That's why the whole Masech Shabbos starts off with the Tzitzis HaShabbos. We're 132. Or Dav Samach Vav Amit Gimel, Samach Vav Column 3. So we've been exploring the meaning of Shabbos and the summation of what we learned about Shabbos was that the Torah describes Shabbos as the day when Kevayachal Hashem rests Kishesh Yisyam Emasa Hashem Sa Shamayim Vesaaret Zuvayoyim Hashvi Shavas Vayinafash On the seventh day he rested Vayinafash What's Pshat Vayinafash? It means, so to speak, his soul comes back to him. Vayinafash he relaxed. Nofesh in modern Hebrew. Nofesh is. Mazen Nofesh? Chofesh, vacation. He relaxed. It's called Nofesh. Nun vafeshin. It comes from this word, Vayinofesh. The obvious question is, oh, we say Vayishbaz Vayimashri. What does this really mean? He rested on the seventh day. So I'll peep shot, Rashi says. It's a metaphor, it's a euphemism. Rashi brings a Parshas Yisra. That loy uh, Hashem didn't toil to create the world, but it means that hiksiv he so to speak describes rest for himself to teach people that they should also pause, they should also take note, they should also so to speak connect to their soul, relax. Right? They once asked a great pianist what made him greater than other pianists. A pianist asked him, why are you so much greater than I am? I follow the notes, you follow the notes, I play masterfully the notes, and you do. He says, the difference between us is the pause. The pauses. You have to be able to know how to pause, and when to pause. So really, Shabbos is the pause. And the pause, as you know, is as integral to the message as the message itself. It's the space that you create between the message. What Rashi says in Vayikra, Litein Revach Ben Parsha Parsha. It's the space that you create in which everything could be internalized. When there's no pause, almost, you know, everything is never ending. So that's on a literal level, on the idea of Shabbos, the glory of Shabbos, the majesty of Shabbos. But here in Torah Er, the Balatanya describes it also in a deeper way. That there's actually an experience of Shabbos Kavayachu Bahashem. What do we mean? What is this experience of Shabbos? So you bring the mashal when somebody does something, 
<coughs> for example, the marshal, somebody writes something. So if you're writing something simple, <coughs> when you're writing a very profound idea, so to get something from your inner mind onto paper is a very long process. And it's, a, it's an intense process. And it's a <coughs> tedious process. Why? Because the way the seichel, the way the idea, the emotion is in my heart, in my mind, is very intense. It's very powerful. It's also very clear. But to put it down on paper, it has to go through a whole process of what he calls tzumtzumim, restrictions. From your chachma to your bina, from your bina to your midas, from your midas to your machshava, from your machshava ultimately all the way down till your writing, till your ksaf. Now this is true even when you want to say something, even when you want to express something, there's, there's, a, there's a need for tzimtzum. Tzimtzum is to restrict it, to channel it. But ksav is even more than speaking. You'll see it's easier for people to communicate verbally than to write. Writing is a whole new avoid because writing is already the next step, even after dibur. Dibur also requires a lot of tzimtzum. But maisa, to get it to maisa, requires even more. To bring it down to ksav. And then, and the same, this is just one example, but the same is to really every, anything that's in your mind, in your heart, to bring it out all the way down to the world of maisa always requires many, many stages of work and development until it finally reaches that state. Obviously, the deeper the idea, the more intense it is, the more the process, the more the difficulty of the process. Because it's, it's abstract, it's deep, it's, it's ethereal, it's, it's nebulous. When you finish, it all comes back to you. All the koiches that you put in, all the lights that you put in, that was in a projected mode, it was in an extroverted mode, now comes back into you. You reclaim it. And his lashon is, all the koiches have now an aliyah, to become re-included in your own self and in the own core of your soul. And he says that's essentially what Shabbos is. The six days of creation represent the divine projection of reality. Meaning, the, 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 the avoida, the energy of the six days of creation is basically the Rebbeinu Shaloylam Kevayachol, projecting from his infinite self the various energies and lights which we call the Midas. The first day of creation is Chesed, and the second day is Gvura, the third day Tiferes, the fourth day Netzach, the fifth day Hoyt, and the Friday, the sixth day, is Yisoyed. But these are all the way the Midas are being projected in order to actually create. They create a universe. And creation, by definition, is projection, it's revelation. It's divine energy being actualized in the world that we observe, in the world that we inhabit, in the world that we live in. So the whole system of the six days of creation is bringing forth, bringing out, channeling, harnessing these energies that are essentially part and subsumed in God's infinity to the point where they ultimately create a world and they evolve to create ultimately a physical world. That means these energies have to go through major, major restrictions and concealments in order to allow them to give rise and birth to something that's finite, to something that's physical, to something that's material, to the point of something that doesn't even recognize its creator, doesn't even recognize its spiritual core, its spiritual source, which means that the energy has to be extremely eclipsed, extremely hidden. That process is an enormous process, and the process is going outward, going away from the self, hiding the self, restricting the self, compressing it in the world. What happens Shabbos? Shabbos you say, Vayishbaz Vayoy Mashvi. Vayoy Mashvi, Shavas Vayinafash. It's after those hours and full week of, of projecting everything, where you sit back, you take a deep breath, and all the energy comes back to you. All the writing comes back to you. All the activity comes back to you. All the projection it comes right back. And where does it go back? It goes back into the core. That's the idea of Shabbos. So Shavas, it doesn't mean he was exhausted and he needed a nap and he needed a vacation, he needed a rest. Obviously, that would only be a mushal that relates to people. After six days, people get exhausted. They need a seventh day to rest. But here the idea of Shavas is 
in a psycho, spiritual, and emotional sense, where all the koiches that you sent outwards now come back to you, and they, so to speak, ascend back into you, and they're reclaimed by you. Huh? That's the idea. And it's on a much bigger level as well, because you already gave it out to others before it comes back of course. quantified. It comes back to you with everything that it, that it created. Up. Everything that it created. And as we clarified, there's a subtle distinction between the mushal and the nimshal. In the mushal, I don't take back what I created. If I'm an artist, and I spent a whole week painting, I have my canvas, I have my quill, I have my colors, my pigments, and it takes tremendous focus and concentration and symptom to bring it out, to channel it. And when I sit down, I like, I get my koyach back, but the art remains on the wall. And hopefully I can sell it and also make a couple of dollars, unless I'm a real artist. <laughs> then I probably can't sell it and make a couple of dollars. <laughs> But the art remains the art. And what I write remains a document or a book or an essay, right? Or a pamphlet. And uh, I finish sweeping or mopping and the floor is mopped. Whatever I finish doing, I finish working on sales or whatever I've been working on, construction, and that whatever is done is done. I just go back to myself. In this case, however, in the Nimshal, where the very stuff of the universe is divine energy, the material is the divine energy. An artist is not creating the material through his energy. He's using pre-existing material to express his talent. He didn't create the colors. He didn't create the... Ca he uses canvas and colors and a brush and he brings it together to create the magic of his art. But it's pre-existing materials and therefore even when his involvement and relationship ends, the material remains intact. I don't go back to myself and the painting doesn't go into me. The painting remains hanging on the wall. The article remains in the computer or on paper. But what if you're dealing with yesh mayayin and you have to understand this? Something from nothing. What do you mean something from nothing? The only material God has with which to make the world is what? His energy. That is what it is. Yesh mayayin means it's something from nothing. Meaning it's not he takes pre-existing materials and he makes a world from it like the artist or the carpenter. The carpenter takes the lumber and he makes a beautiful stender. The goldsmith takes the gold and he turns it into a beautiful vessel. The silversmith takes the silver and turns it into a gorgeous candelabra, menorah. Now the silversmith finishes, the menorah remains. True, without him, there wouldn't have been a menorah. But once he creates a menorah, he created it from pre-existing materials independent of his existence. Hence, even when his involvement ceases, even after he dies, the candelabra that he created remains. The sculpture that he the sculpture made, it's gorgeous. Without him, you wouldn't have had the sculpture. He is the one who made it. It was his art and his chush, his skill and talent. But it remains intact because he used the pre-existing uh, uh, materials, material stone that he used. But what happens if it's your energy that is the material? You don't have any pre-existing material. It's your energy that is creating it. So then when you reclaim your energy, what comes back with you? Everything comes back with you. The whole world goes back to you. So on Shabbos, essentially, the world is transformed from a product of God's words to a product of God's thoughts. That's the sensitivity of the soul on Shabbos. On Shabbos, it's the same world as we know, but it's a different world. And when you have your antennas up on Shabbos, you know you come into the same house. Everything is the same, but nothing is the same. You look at the same person. Everything is the same, but nothing is the same. The Medrash says, You can't compare the shine on the face. Shabbos to the weekdays. Right. Pasuk says in Shira, I am black and beautiful. That's where black is beautiful comes from. So the Medrash says, what happens? What changes? Even the couch doesn't look the same. The food doesn't look the same. Nothing looks the same. What is it? It's the same world. 
But the world, you say, is a holy world. What's up, the world is a holy world? It's not stomach, it's a word, it's a holy world. It means that on Shabbos, something in the very substance of the material world is transformed. It's not any more divine words, it's divine thoughts. Kivoy Shavas Mikal Malachta. What's that Shavas? It's not that the world is not created on Shabbos. The world is intimate on Shabbos. The world is inside of Hashem on Shabbos. Is it the substance that changes, or is my eyes that change? Your eyes change, and the substance change, and they both change together. And if the substance changes, why only those who, are, who keep Shabbos can see it? Most... Most changes, even in substance, requires perceptiveness. Without perception, you know, even if the reality goes through a transformation, one doesn't uh, sense it. Because obviously we're talking here about an internal change. We're not talking about an external change. We know that. We're talking about an internal dynamic. In Pnimi, it's not in Chitzanius. It's not like change. you go out and the car looks any different. It's the same car. In order to see the substance change, I have to... Be you have to be able to be tuned into the world of Pneumius, the world of energy. In the world of energy, it's a different world. And all the malachas of Shabbos revolve from this consciousness, from this awareness. So now he continues. 132, the first column. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Seven lines from the bottom. Ubayoy ma'ashvi k'siva yishbois. All the lights go back to the Koyach HaKloli. What do we mean the Koyach The collective force, the collective power. Kisham over there, Milo Mata Shavin. The top and the bottom, higher and lower identical. The Koyach Kloli of Hashem, his Koyach to create is completely undefined. Poshet Betachlis Abshitas, Poshet comes from the word Mufshet. Mufshet means it's divested from any definition. It's a koyach that's a koyach kloli from which ultimately all the midas come out from. So in the six days of creation, it couldn't remain a koyach kloli. It had to become a koyach prati. Because if it wouldn't be individuated, you wouldn't be able to have an individual world. The whole world is based on diversity and individuality. <coughs> Every creature has its substance and its chemistry and its energy and its unique composition and makeup. Every single insect, every single animal, every single organism, every single blade, every single nivra, doimem, tzemeya, chayim, adab, in the spiritual world and in the physical world. But on Shabbos, everything becomes one. Why? Because it goes back to the koyach haklali, which is pashat. Pashat, betachas, abshutas means simple. Simple here doesn't mean, it's not so simple to be simple. Simple here means simple in the sense, undefined. That's what we mean by simplicity here. It's undefined. It doesn't have a particular character. This is the concept of what's called makif. When you say ur makif, makif means it surrounds it from every side identically. It's a euphemism. It's a mashal for the difference of ur pnimi and ur makif. Ur pnimi means an energy that is custom made for individual people and individual times. And what you can hear today is not what you can hear tomorrow. That's the difference between a personal conversation where you speak to a person in a way that is relatable to their condition right now. Or makif doesn't differentiate. Mikol tzad, it's b'shava. Just like physically, makif means it's around the keli, it's not inside the keli. What do we mean by that? We mean it's not measured and restricted according to the capacity of the keli. It's makif, mikol tzad, b'shava. From every side, it's identically. Spiritually, it means... That it's a type of reality where everything is encompassed identically. Because everything comes back to its source. O Kamaimer, as the expression of Chazal, Tsoifo Mabit at Tsoif Kaladiris. He gazes and looks till the end of all generations. What's the idea of Tsoifo Mabit at Tsoif Kaladiris? So he says, the Pshat is, Shesoiv of Umakif. Kol he soiv of meanings, he encompasses. Tsoifo ma'abit at this is a nusach that we say in the Musaf of Rosh Hashanah. We speak about the zechroinus, so tsoifa, he gazes, right? Ma'abit, he looks at tsoif kaladoiris. He says, doesn't only mean he could see the future, it means 
שסבב ומעקף כל פרוטי ההשתלשלוס ונכלול עם בוי בתכלס ההסקלולוס. He encompasses all the details of all the evolutions of all the worlds and they're all subsumed and included in him in complete unison, in complete cloud. כמו על דרך משל ענה משל אדם המרגיש עצמו בכל פרוטי איבר ומרוי שבעד רגלי בסקירה אחס. A person who experiences himself. What is it like to experience yourself? <laughs> this is a very fascinating muscle. Does any, anybody can describe what is it like to experience yourself? What is it? What does it mean to experience yourself? So you have an experience of a certain aspect of your life. You're experiencing thoughts. You're experiencing emotions. You're experiencing anger, frustration. Sadness, aggravation, confusion, uncertainty, even joy, lightness, serenity, whatever it is. Those are individual experiences of a particular thing outside of me that's causing an experience. But here he's talking about Adam HaMargish Atzmai, a person who experiences himself. What is it like to experience yourself? You have a son that's like you, experience yourself. So some people take videos of themselves the whole day so they yeah, can experience themselves through a video. Instead of when you're sitting there, you're watching the video, they yeah. can see yourself. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so he says, Adama Margish when you experience yourself, you don't, you know, it's not that I'm experiencing my hand, I'm experiencing my head. He says, Biskira Achas, you know what Skira is, with uh, one glance, with one glance, you experience your entire self. What part? Your head, your toe, your pinky, your heart, your kidneys, your liver. Your nose, your ears. No, it's an akuda where everything is part of it. Everything is one. All the nuances, all the details of his avarim, of his limbs, from top to bottom, from head to toe, and everything in between, is all experienced with skira achas. Because there is a space in the self where there is no differentiation, where the entire being is included in the core self. And that's the idea of Shabbos. Shabbos says that the person should be able to come back to that space where they can experience themselves fully. The totality of being. That's the totality of your being. Now, Shabbos is the totality of being of the entire universe, of all of the universes. The, the whole universe, this complete oneness, everything is with one skira, with one glance, it's all there. Now, the, the whole reality is reduced to one core point where everything becomes one. That's the spiritual experience of what Shabbos feels like. That sense of complete cosmic oneness and unity within yourself. The person experiences himself as a full cohesive integrated self. Now if there's a lot of things bothering you it's very hard to go to this place. Right? How do you go into that space of experiencing yourself fully, just your being? There's always a part of you that protests and says, no, I'm not part of you. So that's the ability of Shabbos to be able to take everything back into you and let everything go back to its source where everything has a place. You don't have to push anything away. And therefore, in one glance, you can experience everything. Your type is what he's saying. Huh? You can only do that by clearing everything out. you're focused on business or planning, could you clear everything out? How do you do that? You have to, you have to give place for it. You have to create place for it. That's what it is. Space. So what, did you, what, what did you learn that on Shabbos night, in Bala Shabbos, we turn around so we can say, to look back and see the yeah. replay? That's why we pick it all up, yeah. Reb Tzadik HaKayin of Lublin says, at the end of L'Chadoidi, why do we turn around? Why do we turn around? Everybody turns around. So halachically, there's different reasons. The Avelim, the Pais can bring in Hilcha Shabbos. Mm-hmm. The Avelim would come in Friday night, they would stand in the back so people would greet them. Or Shabbos is like a queen, so to speak, coming from the outside, so you greet the Shabbos. There's different interpretations. One of the interpretations is, some people turn around. <coughs> so one of the interpretations he says is that Shabbos, you try to go into a new space. You go into a new space, you know, Yom Shekulei Shabbos. Especially with Chadoidi, the Kris Kalav, the Shabbos, the Kabla, you're going to soon say Mizma Shalia Ma Shabbos, which is also a form of Kabbalah Shabbos and Halacha. And very often when people go into a new space, there's a challenge. 
The challenge is, what do you do with the old space? You know, what do you do with everything else? So what do you do? You ignore it, you run away from it, you make believe it doesn't exist. So before you say Mizma Shuliyam HaShabbos, you have to turn around. You have to turn around to be able to include everything in it. You have to be able to encompass everything in it. It would be like sometimes a person has a difficult past and they step into a new future. But they sometimes feel that they have to ignore their entire past in order to be able to live a new life. But we can't really do that. Ultimately, I have to turn around and take it all with me. Everything I have been through has to become part of my Shabbos. Because if not, it will disturb my Shabbos. It will ultimately come to haunt my Shabbos. So I can't cut off a part of my life. I shouldn't cut off a part of my life. I ultimately have to... I have to ultimately... I have to give it perspective. I have to put it in context. But I have to be able to take it all along. That's why the rear view mirror is small. That's good. The rear view mirror is small and the windshield is big because... You have to look back, but look you can't go back. Look you have to look back, but you can't go back. Huh? Not larger than larger. Yes, yes, yes. You know, sometimes you meet. You know, you'll talk, sometimes you meet, for example, a person who has the courage to become a baltshuva, and uh, a lot of them feel, and it's not always their own feeling. It's projected by certain community members that they have to cut off their past life in order to mainstream into Jewish life. And it's, it's a sad mistake. It's a sad mistake because this is your beauty. This is your glory. Take it with you. Don't run from it. Yes, of course, there's certain things that you did that you may, won't, you may not continue doing, and some of them are maybe tough and challenging. But, but the experience is all part of your life, and it, it, it's what gives your life a certain richness, a certain majesty. Don't cut it off and don't ignore it, you know, and don't repress it and don't, like, I'm not part of this family anymore. No, this is your family. This remains your mother, this remains your brother, this remains, you know, cherish it. But the same is true in every person's life. So when we go into Shabbos, if it's really Shabbos, it includes everything. If it doesn't include everything, it's not Shabbos. That's his vart. If one part, if one limb is out of it, it's not Shabbos. Then you're in your own uh, space, you know. You're having your own experience, fine. If it's Shabbos, everything is part of it. Because Shabbos reclaims the whole world with Skira Achas. And everything has its place. Everything that happened. I, on Wednesday, you had a very hard day. <laughs> I, on Tuesday, you had this. On Monday, you had this. Okay, that's true. But Shabbos somehow releases the energy of it and brings it back to the source. And this is true about the entire world. About yourself and about the entire world. It's brought in Kabbalah and Kisvei Harizal, you know, the Kabbalah instituted, the whole Kabbalah Shabbos is not from, uh, is not mainstream davening, right? It's interesting, it was accepted by everybody, but till, the Shabbos is a regular Mayrif, the whole introduction that we do, the Chunaran and so we do six Kapitlech Tehillim. You ever focus on the structure of Friday night davening? You're too exhausted. L'chuneran and Shir Hashem, Hashem Malach, Mizmer, Hashem Malach, and Mizmer Ladovit. It's basically six. You could trust me. Six. Then is, then is, then is Ana Bechayach, and then is L'chadaydi. After L'chadaydi is number seven, which is Mizmer Shilia and Mashabas. And then is either Kegavno or Bamem Adlikin. That depends. And then is Barchu and Davenik. And, and regular Maidah that we do every night. So, uh, what are the six Mizmoidim? So, now Rizal says that each Mizmer was made for another day of the week. L'chuner on is Sunday. Shiru Hashem is Monday. And during each one, you focus on what happened during that day of the week, and you can heal it. You can reclaim it. You could take out the energy of that day and bring it back into you, your core. And then you go into L'chadoidi. So, how do you finish L'chadoidi? You always have to go back. And then is Mizmer Shirley Shabbos. Which is number seven. So that's the that's the structure of Kabbalah Shabbos. This was created by the Kabbalists in Svas. The Chadoidi is a poem that was written by Reb Shloim El Kabbitz from Svas, who's in the old cemetery there, one of the blue, you know, the graves that's dyed with blue, is the author of the Chadoidi. He was killed actually, Reb Shloim El Kabbitz, who was a brother in law of the Ramak, Reb Moshe Cordovero, who was the Rebbe of the Arizal and the author of the Sefer HaPardis, Pardis Rimoinim, the Orchard of Pomegranates. This was, their, this was their way of celebrating Shabbos. Alpi Soid, Alpi Nister. 
It's interesting that it was a universally accepted. The whole Kabbalah Shabbos is, even though usually things that after the time of the Gemara are not universally accepted by Jews. It's like Menhagim, you know? Yes, Enechanami. But L'chadoyit, it's interesting. This is, these are, this is a later generation. This is, you know, you're dealing here with the, with the 16th century. Many of them were exiles from Spain. They were exiles from Spain. They came to Tzvah, they escaped. They came to Tzvah, and they created this, uh, this, uh, the, system, the whole, or the, the poem of L'chadoyit of Kabbalah Shabbos. So this is the Nekudah, when a person experiences himself, it's always oneness, and it includes all parts, that oneness. Vizel Inyan Shabbos. That's the Pshat Shabbos. Ki boy Shavas. What's that boy Shavas? What's up? Hu Aliyas ha Oilamis Bepchinis Pnemis. That's Shabbos. Shabbos is all the Oilamis, all the universes go up into a state of Pnemis. Now, Aliyah here doesn't mean physically you put them on an elevator, they go up. Aliyah means from a, the six days of creation, the movement is descent. You read it. From the Klal into the Prat. Shabbos, it's an aliyah from the prat into the klal. From the details into the source, into the core. Six days, it's derech yirida, and Shabbos, it's aliyah sa'ilamis. All the oilamis go up. What do we mean they go up? They sense where they come from. They sense their source, which is a klal. It's oneness, because all the oilamis come from one core. It's just the core gets differentiated, and that's the process of creation. The differentiation of oneness into many, and then Shabbos is the time of attachment of the many into one. What does it say on the dollar? No, no, no. E plur e plur What's the translation, you know? It says it on the cover of the BT. Huh? From many, one. From many, one. So even the American dollar understands this. Yeah? Uh, somebody once had uh, on his store, in God we trust, everybody else pay cash. But from many, one, what's that from many, one? The process of creation is from one many. That's the process of creation. From one many. Hashem Echot comes many. The process of Shabbos is to reveal that the, all the many is really one. And that's why the key, the key prohibition of Shabbos is Hamoitzi Mirishus Lirishus. To be able to take things out from Rishus HaYachet to Rishus HaRabim, that's the greatest violation of Shabbos. Why? Because Shabbos basically underscores the idea that the world is a Rosh Hashanah. The world is one. The world. What's the difference between Rosh Hashanah and Rosh Hashanah? Go to a real Rosh Hashanah with six hundred thousand people, not for shit. Go to a real Rosh Hashanah. Well, maybe here when they're done with construction, maybe this will also become a Rosh Hashanah. It feels like it sometimes. You go to Madison Avenue. You know, walk on Fifth Avenue. Walk on Second Avenue. Yeah, thousands, thousands of people today. Everybody's on their cell, bumping into each other. Right? You ever, you ever have the experience bumping into each other, into poles, into cars? <laughs> it's a mess. People are not getting... What's the fascinating thing about it? The fascinating thing is if you ever have time, and if you're walking from time, you probably don't have time because you're late for an appointment because <laughs> you got stuck in traffic. But if, if, uh, if you have time, <laughs> it's Shabbos, for example, and you could step back, take a look at the people, and you'll see a very interesting phenomenon. Everybody is thinking about something. Everyone who's walking is thinking, and they're in a rush. And everybody's thinking about something else. One person is getting married that night. He's very happy. One person is getting divorced that night. He may also be very happy or very sad. One person just lost a million dollars. One person just made a million dollars. One person is in a fight. One person is making up. But everyone is convinced that what they're thinking about is the center of the universe. There's not one person who thinks that what he's thinking about is not at the core of existence. You could see it. But there's millions of different thoughts going on that everyone is convinced that this is the axis upon which the, the world turns. It's, it's a double bar. That's the definition of real Rishos Arab. Real Rishos Arab means this complete, complete multiplicity. You're in your world, I'm in my world. And in my world, this is the world. And in your world, your world is the world. And you have hundreds of thousands of people simultaneously all convinced the same way. That's the classic Rosh Hashanah. Not just Rosh Hashanah physically. It's Rosh Hashanah mentally. Everybody is a rabbi. What's Shabbos? Shabbos is the idea of Rosh Hashanah To be Megala that it's really one Yachid. It's all from one Yachid. It comes out as a rabbi. That's what creation is. 
And that's part of the process. This is how it's going to tie into the whole issue of Akudim and Toyu and Tikkun, which is really the process from many, from one many, and then going back from many to one. That process, Shabbos, therefore, the first Malacha that's discussed in Masech the Shabbos is Yitzhiyas HaShabbos, HaMaitzim Yerushos Yerushos. So I mentioned to you, Toysfus asks the Gavaldi Kakasha, it's the 39th Malacha, why is it the first one in Masech the Shabbos? Right? The Alter Rebbe's explanation is because it's the core, key core of Shabbos. It's the essence of Shabbos. HaMaitzim Yerushos Yerushos is ultimately all of Shabbos is Maitzim Yerushos Yerushos. <laughs> All of Shabbos, all Malachas Shabbos is about Moitzim Rishus Rishus. It's about not recognizing the Rishus HaYochid nature of the universe. And that's the idea of taking out from Rishus HaYochid to Rishus HaRab basically is what Shabbos, is what the violations of Shabbos represent. Going out from the Klal into the world of, into the world of Pram. That's why Oynas Tamid HaChamim Shabbos La Shabbos. That's why the time of intimacy is Shabbos. Because what's the idea? The idea is... <coughs> The same idea, the zivug, the attachment, the connection. We have two people, they're Purusha Sarabim. I am I, you are you. Two people becoming one, Vahayu Labasar Echot, that's the essence of Shabbos. Since that's the essence of Shabbos, that's why that's Aynas Tamadik Chacham. That's the time of that's the time of intimacy in Allah. Friday night. Because that's the energy of Shabbos. The energy of Shabbos is Azman of Yichud. That's why we say in Kagavna, Kagavna di inun misyacha din la beechot. You remember the words. Just like Le'ela, Le'ela means above. Everything is united in Echad. Lamata, Lasata. Lasata means Lamata. Down there, everything is also Be'echad. And he goes through the whole Kagavan of the process. You want to give us a Raza de Shabbos, anybody? Erev Shabbos, you light two candles. And Motzah Shabbos, that means it's two candles. Motzah Shabbos is a Shalhevis. The candles become one. Friday night, everybody lights their own candle. Matzah Shabbos, all the wicks converge to make one flame, a Shalhevis. Because it's after Shabbos. It's the oil of Shabbos that you want to take into the rest of the week. That's why Matzah Shabbos is a Shalhevis. See, that's what. Aliyah Sa'olim is Bibchinis Pnimis. Vinichlalim Bekoyach Akloli Hapashat Betachlis Aiskalis. What happens to all the world? They don't disappear. They're all subsumed. They're Nichlal in the Klal. In the Koyach HaKloli, the collective Koyach, HaPashet Betachlis HaPshittis, which is not defined by any particular quality or item. If it's defined, it can include everything. Here's a Klau. Anything that has a definition only includes things that have definitions similar to it. In order to be able to encompass everything, you have to be Pashet Betachlis HaPshittis. You can't be defined by anything. This is true in your own life as well. In order to make space for everything in your life, you can't define your life by anything. If you define your life as a particular color, then you have to reject certain aspects of your life. You have to be able to be open to endless possibility. The same is true. What does it take to be a Neshama Klal? It says about Moshe Rabbeinu. He asked Hashem in Parshas Pinchas, you should appoint Ish Asheruach Boy. So what does Rashi say from Sifri? You should be able to relate to the individual ruach of every person. How do you relate to every person? If you have a particular color, a particular definition, then you can only accept those that have similar colors, similar definitions, similar experiences, similar characteristics. Only when you can have that place of pasha betachel sabshitis, you don't define yourself, so now there could be space for every type of ruach. It's a very profound experience. A true leader, a true is called an Ashama Klalis. What's that an Ashama Klalis? It's called, the Balatanya calls a leader an Ashama Klalis. What's that an Ashama Klalis? Ashama Klalis literally means a general soul, but it really means something much deeper. An Ashama Klalis means an Ashama that originates in the world of Klal, not in the world of Prat. An Ashama that originates in the world of Klal, not in the world of Prat. If I originate in the world of Prat, then there's certain people that get on my nerves. <laughs> I can't be other way. If you originate in the world of Klau, then you're not defined by anything. Since you're not defined by anything, you're not turned off by anything also. <laughs> That's a real Rebbe. A real Rebbe is an Ashama Klaulis. There's no Jew that doesn't find space there. There's no type of person that, as I'm a Shugana. That's a Doesn't uh, There's no space in my, in my base medrash for him. <laughs>
Your, your typhus, that's a, that's a kaya chakla. Even, even if that person can't take me. Yes. Still even if that person can't take me, I still could take him. He doesn't have space for me, but I have space for him. I even have space for the part of him that doesn't have space for me. I have space for that too. I really don't take it personal. I, I have space even for that dimension. Not just I have space for him because I overlook. I have space even for that part that doesn't have space for me. But that's a certain type of it's a certain sensitivity. Yeah. Hapashet betachlus ha'iskalalus kayach haklali the collective kayach hapashet which is undefined. Pashet why is pashet called simple? It comes from the word mufshet, hefshet in carbon is that hefshet. You know what hefshet means? Skinning. Pashet means you skin everything from layers, and here it means you skin everything from definitions. It's mufshet. It's divested from any character, description, or item, or color. That's called Koya Chaklali. And this is also, in, in Torah, there's two elements of Torah, of Yiddishkeit. Right? There's the Torah of Prat, and there's the Torah of Klau. What's the difference of the Torah of Prat and Torah of Klau? The Torah of Prat is made up of billions, billions, and billions of particles. The Torah of Klal is not a particle, it's a wave. In physics, it's not a particle, it's a wave. It's not, a t it's not made up of details. It's one essence. And the essence includes all the details. <coughs> now, is it possible that a person should be able to learn a sugi and Gemara and see the Klal of it <coughs> versus the Prat? We could learn our whole lives. All we see is one Prat, another Prat, another Prat, another Prat. <coughs> this detail, that detail, another detail, that detail. And then hopefully after a few years you have a few details together. But even if you have a lot of details because you have a good memory and yechaz and yechaz and yechaz, right? So even if after 17 years of yeshiva you have a lot of details in your head, you, you have six, seven mesechtas down pat or whatever it is, but what is it? It's a lot of protim in the database of your brain. You didn't necessarily touch the kalal of Torah. You could... Huh? The canvas, the bigger picture. Yeah. The Rambam is called in Jewish in Jewish literature Hanesher Hagadol, the Great Eagle. Why is he called the Great Eagle? They couldn't find another <coughs> expression for the Rambam. Wasn't the Nesher Hagadol? The answer is, there's what's called a bird's eye view of Judaism. But in birds themselves, there's the eagle's view. The eagle has a perspective of everything. In order to be able to write the Sefer of the Rambam, the Yada Chazaka. He couldn't learn every halach and then know it. He had to be able to fly above and see everything, beskira achas. In one glance, see the whole thing, you almost see oneness. How does that translate into learning? It translates into learning by revealing, basically, even in detailed machloikasin or discussions, the nekuda klolist which it comes from. And there you can have hundreds of sugyas that seem disconnected, but really it's one. It's just manifested in different ways, but really it's one. Yeah. The Rakachava brings, how do you know this? <laughs> the Rakachava brings, there's a Toisefta in Sanhedrin. Very interesting. The Toisefta. The price, it's not like, the price is Toisefta in Sanhedrin. The Gemara brings a Machlaikas. The, the price brings a Machlaikas. It says that a Rav, if he has two Talmidim, and one, one is Shoyal Kenya, one is Shoyal Shaloy Kenya. Yeah. You're learning Hilchis Muktza. And suddenly somebody pops up and says, well, what's the din when it comes to ribis? So he says, you come back to me tomorrow. And you answer the person who's asking about the Indian, not about the Nana. That's one shit. The Braise brings another shit. No. No. Call, this is the quote. Call a Torah Indian Echad. The whole Torah is one Indian. It's very hard. What do we call Torah Indian Echad? We're learning Hilchas Ribis. We're learning Hilchas Kshira on Shabbos. We're not learning Chesha <coughs> Mishpat. We're not learning Hilchas Mechir or Hilchas Gitten. You're learning Hilchas Brachim. We're not learning Hilchas Kedushan. We're not calling it to you in Yenechat. It's not in Yenechat. This depends how you learn. In the world of Prat, of course it's not in Yenechat. And it can't be in Yenechat. Listen, if a teacher goes and says everything is one, <laughs> there's no learning. <laughs> You have to have the differentiation. 
But on the other hand, on a deeper level, it's all in Yenechad. It's all in Yenechad. There's a Chidush Harim, he says, he says in Parshas Yisra, by Yedaber Elakim is Kol Hadvarim Ba'ela Lamer, Anoichi Hashem Elakech. So Chazal already struggled with the words, by Yedaber Elakim is Kol Hadvarim Ba'ela Lamer. It could have said, by Yedaber Elakim, Anoichi Hashem Elakech. Obviously. What do you have to give an introduction? Hashem said all of these words, and then you tell me what the words are. Just tell me what he said, like every Pasuk in Chumash. Vayidabr Hashem al Moshe Lamer. doesn't say, Vayidabr Hashem, all the following words, and this is what they looked like. Tell me what he said. I know this is what he said. Vayidabr al Akim, Anoche Hashem al Obviously it was all these words, not other words. So the Chidush Yerim says, Azai, Vayidabr al Akim, as Kol Advarim Ha'ele, refers to the whole Torah. Because the whole Torah is included in Asayr Sadebris. The whole Torah of Bavli, Yerushalmi, Mishnai, Gemari, Rishayna, Machroina, Malach, Rishal, Shetruvah, Poiskim, everything. Kol HaTorah, Kol HaMamash. Vayidabra Lekim, Es Kol HaDvarim Meil. All the words of the whole Torah, Lamer, it was to bring out one point, Anoichi Hashem Alekech. Kol HaDvarim Meil is to bring out the point of Anoichi Hashem Alekech. What if I, but I, what I see all these words, I don't hear Anoichi Hashem Alekech. I hear this, that, that. That means I'm not Taifas than a Kudu. The Nekuda ultimately is Achdos. And even the arguments, you trace it back higher and higher and higher and higher. That's the, called the Torah of Shabbos. There's the Torah of the weekdays and there's the Torah of Shabbos. Torah that we do, the Torah of Prat. The Torah of Shabbos is a Torah of a Torah of Klam. Okay, 132. We're holding the second column on the top, right? Now, here we're confronted with a dilemma with a challenge and that's the challenge that begins to be addressed on the first line of the second column on page 132 of this Maimer the Ikra Shabbos Laman it's not addressed as a question and an answer but it's really a question is, in, is so to speak silently being inserted here And the question is as follows. We gave a whole beer what Shabbos is. At length, what Shabbos is. And at <coughs> his final words about Shabbos is that Shabbos is Aliyas Ha'olamis, Bebchinis Pnimis, Vinichlalim, Bekoya, Haklali, Haposhet, Betachlis, Haiskalalis. It's where the world leaves the realm of Prat and enters into the realm of Klam. Or as mentioned, the world leaves the realm of Rishus Sarabim, which is the definition of society. You are you and I am I. And it enters into the realm of Rishus HaYachit. Before Shabbos, we might see the world mir Rishus HaRabim, and we're machnas it le Rishus HaYachit, and that's where we're supposed to keep it. That's where we're supposed to keep it. That's what Shabbos is. Sensitivity to Shabbos means sensitivity to the truth that the entire universe and all of the universes are <coughs> subsumed, are, so to speak, uh, consumed, swallowed up. Well, the word is not so much swallowed up, but uh, are uh, contained. Engulfed. contained or engulfed in the Koyach HaKloli, HaPashet Batachlis HaEskalolos, a koyach that's not defined by any individual characteristic, and therefore it encompasses everything, but it encompasses everything in an undefined way, and that's where the universe has come back to, as the energy kivayachal of the Rebbeinu Shalom that's been projected goes back into its ultimate core, its ultimate source, where there's only a cloud, where there's only oneness. Hence the world is holy, hence the world is one, Hence, Malach is forbidden on Shabbos. All the qualities of Shabbos come from this Nekuda of Kivoy Shavas by Yishbaz by Yom Ashri. What's Shavas? Shavas is the return of the energy back into its source. And when the world goes back into its source, from a Prat it becomes a Klal. And here there's absolute Achdos, there's absolute cohesiveness, there's absolute integration. The famous Yerushalmi, that Afilu Am Ha'aretz Eine Meshaka B'Shabbos. In other words, to lie on Shabbos is contrary to the very definition of Shabbos. 
So the Shabbos are filu amaaretz ainem shakar b'Shabbos. In other words, Shabbos is a time of complete truthfulness and complete cohesiveness when the world goes back to its source. Kivoy Shabbos. As a result of this, we understand that what happens really on Yom HaShabbos is that there's a transformation. When reality is seen in a whole week, it's seen in a, from one perspective. When reality is experienced on Shabbos, it's the same reality. The same reality. And Bechitzoini is externally, nothing changes. It's the same world on Shabbos that you have in the six days. But if your antennas are up, so to speak, and you're sensitive <coughs> to the pnimius, to the energy of the world, it's not anymore God's speech. It's God's thought. Kivoy Shavas. Ba'asara mamaris nivra ha'olam. The world was created through speech. Vayoymer elikim, vayoymer, 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 asara mamaris. Or as the Pasuk says in Tehillim, bidvar Hashem shamayim nasu. Uveruach piv kol tzavon. Bidvar Hashem. So when you say God rested, what did he rest from? Not from action. He rested from words. But what does it mean he rested from words? He rested from words as the pshat that there's no dibur. But how's the world created on Shabbos? And you say the world has to be created continuously. The pshat is machshava. What's the difference between machshava and dibur? Dibur is outside of me. Machshava is inside of me. Words are projected outward. People can take your words and misconstrue them. Everyone interprets words the way they wish. People hear what they want to hear. People hear what they have to hear. People hear what they're capable of hearing, not more. Thoughts, you can't distort my thoughts, because my thoughts are internal. The Gemara says, Nobody knows what anybody else is thinking about. It would have been an interesting world if everybody knows what everybody is thinking about. <laughs> it would be a little difficult, you know. You're thinking about somebody in a particular way and he knows exactly what you're thinking. It would have been a very interesting world, maybe refreshing. But imagine if every person you're ever sitting in front of knows exactly your thoughts about him or her. <laughs> huh? It would have been refreshing, yeah? Chaotic. Would you be ready for that? For five minutes. No, for two seconds. It's interesting that we control our thoughts pretty quick. Huh? I said we would control our thoughts pretty quick. You become isolationist. Control. The question is would you repress them or you would control them or you would harness them? That's a question. You may stop thinking. We may, we may have learned to stop thinking. That's true. Okay, which is sometimes maybe a good thing to stop thinking. But in the world of Machshav, it's an internal world. It's inside of me. So when you say on Shabbos, the world is not anymore a product of divine speech. It's a product of divine thought. What does this mean? This is the idea of Kivoy Shavas. That it's not anymore projected outwardly. In other words, that the Midois go out and they go through a symptom until they go down all the way to the Ksav, to the marshal of the writing, as he spoke before. But now it goes back up. Aliyah Sa'olamis, Bibchinis Pnimiyis, from Dibur to Machshava. In other words, it's all inside of him, so to speak. When it's inside of him, and what, what do we mean inside of him? Back to the Kayach HaKlali, which is Pashat Batachal Sabshitis. There's complete cohesiveness and integration. Now we have a big kasha. What's the kasha? The kasha is one line. So why didn't the man come down on Shabbos? So why is the man also resting on Shabbos? Because the man rests on Shabbos. Because what did we learn about the man? There's lechem in aretz, and you have to remember everything we learned before. Lechem in a Lechem in Aretz comes from which world, Oilam? Hatoyu. And Lechem in Hashemayim comes from where? Shanal Tzvagesen? Akudim. Very good. Akudim. What's Akudim? Isn't Akudim Shabbos? Isn't Akudim? What we learned about Akudim synonymous with what we just learned about Shabbos? That's the problem here. We explained that there's lechem in aretz, which is basically tikkun elevating toyu. That's what lechem in aretz is. That's the second brach of berachas hamazon. The world of mhoida ala koyl hashem alekeinu anachnu moidim loch. The maimonim daf manhalten kap. It's not. Uh, this is not the. Shalosh uh, <laughs> uh, three and a half minute toyna. 
that you have a nice soul. You're a good person. So if you tell him, <laughs> if, le- if lechem in hasha, lechem in aritz is, if lechem in aritz is toyu, versus lechem in hashamayim is beyond toyu. It's the p'china of Moshe, which is the oilam of akudim. The oilam of akudim is not the sarusa de lasata that creates the sarusa de laela. It's the tikkun that brings Toyu back to its source, and as a result of that, gets the flow and the energy of Toyu, v'achalta v'savato v'erachta es Hashem alekecha, lo yala lechem levado yichia ha'odam, ki al kol moitza pi Hashem yichim, that even the Adam, Adam ha'elyoin, the spheres of Atzilus, oilam ha'tikon, also gets hashpa from lechem and aret through Toyu. This is why it's confusing, because... When you narrowed it down? No, no. You narrowed it down? That's why it's confusing for you. <laughs> you mean, let's just add the words for you. Yeah. Because we bring back Tohu and shine it, we bring back Tikkun, and then we shine it through Tohu to reach a higher level, which is what we're doing Lechem and Ares. That's not really Akudim. Akudim was, I mean, that's not at least the way I understand it. Akudim was all the spheros integrated, etc., before there was ever differentiation. Right. This is... So Aku, when we talked about Akudim being after differentiation coming back, we really talked about that as being Brutim. You're right. You're right. So Excellent. You're right. Akudim is beyond Toyu. Akudim is when there's no differentiation yet. There's absolute, that's why we said it's ten lights in one vessel. And as he explained, it's not that there's no, it's not that the Midas are not intense there. On the contrary, they're all infinite. But what's felt in them is that it was a Din in the Ein Saif. That's Akudim. Versus Toyu, where the identity of the self emerges, and when that's extreme and primal, it creates absolute chaos. And hence, there's an explosion and a breakdown, and hence there's a new world called Brudim, which is taken with this compromise, and mitigation, and arbitration, and integration, and synchronization, and any more words you want to put in here. There's symmetry, and there's give and take, and there's borrowing and lending, and there's... Noisen and Lekeach and all... Rapprochement. Ah? Huh? Rapprochement. Rapprochement. Yes, yes. <laughs> because, because it's, so to speak, a, 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 a protest against what happened in Toyu, where every Mida was, was completely ain't safe and had no space for any other Mida, and not, not even space for its own Kalim, and therefore it broke on all counts. So the mom, the mom is, but he said the Mon is Akudim. The Mon represents... Oh. Not a food that needs birur. It's toyu had a shvira. That's why the man has no psilus, right? The Gemara says in Yuma, lechem abirim achal ish, lechem shamalachi asharis oichlem. It's it's the man has no psilus. What's the idea of psilus? The idea of psilus is that every food that we eat needs to go through the avoid of birur, the avoid of boirer. That's what the body does. The body basically is always doing what we call in Malachas Shabbos boirer. It's always selecting. That's what your body does, and the body is an expert. Even though the body never learned Sukhanarukh Arachaim Simon Shinyu Tess, the body instinctively, from the moment it develops, it knows exactly the laws of Bayer. And the laws are basically I have to search for the part of the food that I will allow to be converted into my bloodstream, and I have to identify the parts of the food that belong in uh, in the base in the base covet. In the base covet. And the body does this the moment you take that piece of food and you put it on. You know when digestion starts? That just doesn't start here. Digestion starts right here. The right here. The saliva of the tongue is already the first, the, best. the first component in the body that's right away detecting what are you dealing with. Right away. And digesting this amylase. This right. Is, uh, and digesting. And then, of course, it continues as it breaks down every piece of food and identifies exactly where it belongs in the body or outside of the body. So the mind also represents... Huh? The mind didn't, didn't have this process. No, p- no psoilus. Why no psoilus? Because there's no shmir. Psoilus is... Because Toyo goes through a shmir and you have to be mavar. You have to elevate. You have to identify the parts of the food. Just like physically you identify the foods that are nutritious and the foods that are garbage. Right? And in one food itself you can have... Usually you'll have a combination of garbage and nutrition. It's spiritually speaking, every food is that way. Every physical item is that way. To identify the nitzutz, the lakus in it, the spark in it. 
that's only in Lechem and Haaretz. And that's the mile of Lechem. And we need the Lechem and Haaretz because Tikkun needs Toyo as much as Toyo needs Tikkun. They need each other. But the Mami says, came b'schus Moshe. This is Lechem and Hashemayim. It's like heavenly. It comes down. It's like a, it's like a Haman kiz, kiz, Kizera Lovon. Lovon. Lovon in the sense is that it's colorless. Ah? Huh? Ketzapiches bedvash. Ketzapiches bedvash. The placement of the mind also represented the internal working of the individual. It wasn't external. So That's the more true. internal he was, closer That's it was. true. That's true. You mean where it came? So I'm saying you said before, the inside and the outside, you know, Hashem created from internal thought versus yeah. Dibor. So thought is more like the man, the placement of the man is closer to the person's yeah. thought. Yeah. And in fact, the Torah says, why did they call it man? You know why they call it man? Kilayadu mahu. And in Parshat Sekev, it says, he gave you, vayancha ve'erekha ve'yechel asheloi. You didn't know and your fathers didn't know. So the Balatanya teaches, it's l'mayla mi'yidiya. On the man, the definition of the man is that I don't know what it is. <laughs> that is its name. Its name is I don't know what it is. Like Chachma is Koyachma, the same thing. It's the definition is Ma, what is it? That is the best definition. The best definition of certain things is I don't know what it is. Ah, now you're saying something. What? Yes, Svaslo Yadati Yeshma. If you would know what it is, then it's not it. Sometimes if you know what it is, it's not it. If you don't know what it is, oh, this is a, this is a good simon. It was created before Bria Sarai in the man? Was that one of the seven things that was created? Bilam's donkey, the, the yams of the split, the, the Moshe stick. The seven we know you know the other six, but the, we were worried about the seven things. And you, you. And me, and I was created. You're one of them. The mom and the There's eight now. No, it's a madrash or some things. Asarid Shabbos ben Ashmoshes. So the Maral says all the things that don't fit in, Mamash, you know, Twilight Zone. Was, was that mine when it was one of them? Or you don't remember. I'll Google it. Erev Shabbos ben Ashmoshes. Why don't you Google it? Open up the Mishnah Berkeley office. It's too much Google it. Google it. Google it. Please. I'd never get anything done. So now the question is, and what's Shabbos? We're saying the whole week the energy goes outwards and gets individuated into the details of creation. On Shabbos, Kivayachal, it all goes back to the Kayach HaKlali. That sounds just like Akudim. You're telling me the man came from Akudim. So the man and Shabbos, L'chayr, is Hainuach. And yet we all know that Lechem Mishnah started on Friday. It came down on Friday, not on Shabbos. That's the question that's bothering the Balatanya. Now, just the question itself could give you a little bit of an appreciation of his Mahalach in teaching Hasidus. Such a question you won't find in other Sifri Hasidus because this is almost like a, like a sugi in Gemara and now you want to figure out why is the man not on Shabbos? In other words, he took so seriously the idea of Akudim being the man and Lechem and Aretz being Toyu and Tikkun and now Shabbos going back to the source and he said, after all this, let's go into Shabbos and now he's bothered by this question, so why doesn't the man come down on Shabbos? Because that's exactly the derech of the Balatanya, that everything, even in Pnimi Yisatayra, as much as possible, should be understood, comprehended, conceptualized, internalized, like a sugi in halacha, like a sugi in nigla. What it means? It's something that doesn't shtim here. Now, usually when it comes to mystical stuff, okay, tell me something inspiring. What shtim? When shtim? Came shop, didn't come shop. What's vilsta for me? But if there's a real system, if there's a real system that's developing, the system, if it's not a system, it's not a system. But if it's a system, you have to understand the system. And as you'll realize, all the Maimarim are based on systems. And he cherishes the fact that it's based on There's a system, there's a pattern. There are modalities of spiritual vocabulary. So now let's see. What's the difference between Shabbos and Man? What, what do you mean, what's the difference? The difference is you explain to me that Man comes from Akudim. Now he gives an answer. <laughs> the answer is going to be Deutsch a lot of beer because this is uh, profoundly, profoundly abstract. But let's read. If you recall, when we learned about Akudim, I don't know if I mentioned or somebody mentioned, that this mimer goes a step above Akudim. Even though you would think there's no step above Akudim, but he does. For example, in Noyach, when we learned about Akudim, Nekudim, and Brindu, he didn't go beyond Akudim. Akudim was the key, was the, the first. 
But here he goes beyond Akudim. Shabbos is not Akudim. The man is Akudim. Shabbos is beyond Akudim. But you say, what could be beyond Akudim? L'chayda, Nekudim I understand. The spheres are separate. Akudim, you said, is the hergish of the Ein Saif, infinity. And infinity includes everything. And that's why it includes all the Midas. So he says, V'ikira hefer shebin Shabbos l'man, ki b'man ha'yizgalus u'mebchines mokr ha'shayich l'hishtalshalus. By the man, the revelation of the man came from a source, one source, but it's shayich l'hishtalshalus. It's relatable, it's connected. Shayich means connected. It's relatable to the hishtalshalus, to the evolution of reality. K'moi b'chines ha'kudim, sh'okud b'kliyechad, Akudim means it's bound up, akud. All the ten lights are bound up in one vessel. mikol hakol In akudim you have all the pratim of ishtalshalus. Everything is there, but it's hiskalalus. It's all a cloud. That's what we said about Shabbos. It's all there. If it's in akudim and brudim, it's in akudim. But it's all hiskalalus. There's no conflict. There's no compet- competitiveness. There's no war, there's no breakdown, there's no shvira, like in Tayyum. Why? Because what's felt there is the Ein Soif. What's felt is that it's an expression of infinity. And the way it's integrated in a klal is, How could there be? All the pratim, all the nuances, and all the details of Ishtalshalus, how can they all be there? Who mitzad, because this is a source that is relatable to Ishtalshalus. So ultimately, he himself, Akudim, is also somewhat in the Erech of Ishtalshalus. It's just the genesis of the source. It's the beginning of the birth of Ishtalshalus. It's the it's the embryo, it's the seed. Lachain, his galus shaloi, who al derech his galus haklal. So when Akudim is revealed, it's like the klal. Asher shayech la pratim asher nechlolim boy. And the klal is always connected to the pratim that are in the klal. Ein bedrush doir haflogim in yin Akudim. The klal and the prat are connected. Yes, you can't compare prat to klal. Prat is an individual detail. Klal always includes many pratim. But by definition, he says, you cannot completely separate the klal from the prat. In fact, the definition of the klal here is that it encompasses all the pratim. All the pratim are here in the pchina of klal. That's what Akudim represents. That's what the man represented. All the pratim are here, but the pratim are not individually differentiated and compartmentalized and fragmented, and hence you have to negotiate between the yachid and the tzibur, between socialism and capitalism, between oneness and diversity, in akud, in nekudim and brudim, you're negotiating. In toyu, individualism reigns, and in tikkun, the collective body reigns. But the reason you're negotiating is because there's differentiation. There's you and I. The question is, what do we do with the you and I? Do we nullify it? Do we obliterate it? Or do we not obliterate it? Do we fight? How do we deal with that? So you have Nakudim deals with it in one way, Brudim deals with it in another way. Akudim is before differentiation. It's the way the Pratim are in the Klal. The way the Pratim are in the Klal, what's felt? What's felt is the Klal. But the Klal is like a mother. The klal is a mucker. It's a source for hishtalshalus. But since it's the source, it's the seed. It's like in the semen, in the, in the sperm, in the tipa. You have the micros- microscopically, you have the whole fetus. It's not that you don't have it. It's not that you don't have it. They used to think the tipa is tama tipa. Today we know in the tipa you have everything. Right? It's just not fleshed out. In the seed of the apple tree, you have the apple tree. In fact, every property that will emerge in the apple tree is there in the seed. It has to develop, it takes time, it takes years to flesh out. But all the pratim come from the klal. In other words, the klal is defined by the pratim. What makes it a klal? That I'm a klal. What am I a klal of? What does a klal mean? Klal, you saw, what am I a klal of? That I'm koilo. 
We say it's called a koilo. What's that koilo? It's koilo. It includes in Allah you have what's called Isr koilo. You have Isr koilo, Isr Moisif. What's Isr koilo? It's a klal. It's koilo. It encompasses all the Pratim. But not in a differentiated way, in a unified way, in an integrated way. And here we have, of course. Is it still different than Akudam? This is why he's defining Akudam. Akudam is the ultimate klal. So the question is even more. So, so, is, is, so is, is, this, is this the same? type of relationship between the Prat and the Kalal, as you've spoken of many times in terms of Kalal Yisrael, in terms of the individual, yeah. or there is there more specific identity, still have to have a recognition of these things, in it, or is that more really like like uh, like Bruden? Is Kalal Yisrael is really Depends, there? depends. When you talk about Kalal Yisrael, if you're talking about in the seed, then it's Akudim. If you're talking about when we speak about Kalal Yisrael, it's more like Bruden. Like when he speaks about Neshama, for example, of being right. uh, representing Kalal Yisrael, that would be right. like this type of Akudim. Right, right. Neshama Klolis. The Kalal, you mean from yesterday? Uh, a few weeks, I believe we said it. That a Neshama encompasses, yeah. So that's like a Kalal that includes all the Pratim. Is that Shabbos? No, that's not Shabbos. That's Akudim. That's not Shabbos. If that would be Shabbos, the man would come down on Shabbos. Yesterday that was Shabbos. <laughs> yeah, yesterday this was Shabbos, that's true. But today is already closer to Shabbos, so it's already an under Shabbos. It's an under Shabbos. They used to say, Ayid Zuntik Tracht Montik, was wird sein Dinstik? Mitzvach Tracht, Donnerstik is an of Shabbos, right? The Jew who never went to work. They asked him, why don't you go to work? So he says, a Jew Sunday thinks Monday. What do I do on Tuesday? Wednesday he starts thinking, new Thursday. Tomorrow's already Friday. Shanet of Shabbos. Let's call it a week. <laughs> That's how many people live, you know? Ayid zuntek, tracht montek. Hayoyim yom nishim b'Shabbos. Hayoyim yom cheni b'Shabbos. Hayoyim shlishi b'Shabbos. So this is the cloud. Now, the truth is, every morning we speak about it. Bishma alayma b'shloy shesri midis atayr in the Right? The 13 formulas through which we explain Torah. So you have Kalva Chaimer, you have Gzei Rishava, you have Binyan of Mikasav Echad, Binyan of Meshach Suvim. Lenny, you ever thought about these words? Yeah, I still don't know what to mean. <laughs> Klalu Prat. Some don't you know. You remember? Klalu Prat. Yeah. Prat Klal. Yeah? Klal Prat Klal. Iyat Adon Ela. Ke'ena Prat. Miklal Shot Tzorich Lefrat. Miprat Shot Tzorich Leklal. What is going on here? What is going on here? It doesn't stop with Klal and Prat. But before that, there was something called Binyanav. What are all these things? The truth is that the Shloish Esri Midis of Atari Nidreshes are really, it says in Zoya, that they're Mechuvan to the Yidgim Midis Harachim. The Yidgim Midis Harachim correspond to the Shloish Esri Midis. In fact, the Noyim Alimelech writes, the Rebbe of Melech writes, the Rebbe Alimelech of Lejens, Bishloish Esrei Midis Atayr Nidreshes, only a person who possesses the Yud Gimel Midis Arachemim could darsh in Torah. Bishloish Esrei Midis Atayr Nidreshes. Only if you have the Yud Gimel Midis Arachemim are you capable of Atayr Nidreshes. Because all the drashas of Torah are a reflection of the Yud Gimel Midis Arachemim. Without the Shloish Esri Midis, you're not in that position because you don't get it. You don't, you don't, you're not in tune with it. You're not in tune. So one of the biggest paradigms to deal with in Shloish Esri Midis is Klal Prat. To understand how Chumash works, how the Tanakh works, and you have Klal Prat, you have Prat to Klal, and you have Klal, Prat and Klal. What's the difference? What's the difference between the two? So let me give you one example. Rashi brings this. Rashi brings in a few places. Just uh, giving one example of uh, literally hundreds. We'll take the Mitzayra shaving off his hair. Right? The Mitzayra shaving off his hair. So Rashi tells us a klal and a prat and a klal. Mitzayra perik yidalat posik tes. Vahoya bayoy mashvi on the seventh day. Listen to a posik. This is a leper who wants to purify himself. Yigalach es kol So he goes through this whole process. And he, uh, he, he washes his clothes, he shaves off his hair, and he sits for seven days. On the seventh day, he shaves off all his hair. Okay, I understand what it means, all his hair. I would understand wherever I have hair, I shave it off. I cut it. No. his head, his beard, his of his eyebrows. All of his hair, Chazal, right away, their antennas go up. Walter. You said he cuts off all his hair, you could have finished. No. 
Now you start telling me where the hair is. I don't know where hair is. On the head, on the beard, on the eyebrows. And then you go again. Veskol Sa'arai. Here is a classic. Klau, Prat, Uklau. You started off with all the hair. But apparently you felt that that wouldn't do well for me. So you started to tell me where. But you didn't say everywhere. For example, people have hair in other places. They don't have hair only on their head and in their beard. And then at the end you go back. as Kol Sa'arai. How do we understand this? What do we do with this? Rashi right away says, from Mesech Tesoyte, Tezayin, Ahol Sugya, Klau, Prat, or Klau. If I would have said only the Klau, what would I say? All the hair. Anywhere there's hair in your body, you got to go off. So the Torah starts specifying. So if you want to specify, just specify. Don't tell me Kol Sare. So first you do a Klau, then you go a Prat. In other words, you minimize, then you go back to the Klau. So that means it's not only those specific places, because then you wouldn't give me a claw. So you start with a claw, you go to the prat, and then you go back to the claw. So Rashi says, Lahavi kol makam kinos seyer venira. It includes every place where there is a gathering of hair, kinos seyer, where there's a gathering of hair, but it has to be venira visible. So for example, what would be excluded? Chest hair. Ah? Huh? Chest hair or groin hair. No, chest is visible, but for example, under oh, on your under under the arms, because that's not, vi- I mean, it could be visible, but in the regular posture of a person, it's not visible. Ah, it says kol right? but then you said the hair, I mean the head, the beard, the eyebrows, these are all visible, and then you say the whole hair. So it means it's not only this, it's also more, but it's limited that it has properties that are similar to these. What's similar? It's kinos, they're all gathered, it's a bunch of hair, it's not, if I have an isolated hair somewhere hidden, I don't have to get rid of it, it has to be a kinosayer, many hairs together, like on the beard or on the head, and it also has to be veneer. Klal pratu klal. That's why Chazal say, Ein bechlal, elo, masha befrat. But, it's more than the prat. It's more than prat, but it's a klal that includes all the prat. And what do we learn from here? We learn from here that the definition of klal is taking all the protein and tracing them back to their klal. But what I'm doing is I'm tracing the protein back to their klal. Klal is not abstraction. Klal is taking the protein back to their abstraction. You understand the difference? Klal is not abstraction. It would be abstraction, it would be all the hair. No, no, no. It's the head and the eyebrow, but I'm taking them back to their klal. What's their klal? Two things. Kinosei or venire? You typhus this? You probably have to understand this in Nigla. You're taking, you're finding the common denominator of the protem. That's what klal is. You're not telling me the beard. If you would tell me the beard, I would shave my beard. You're not telling me that. But that's only klal after you had the prot. Before right. you had the klal, you didn't know that yet. But it started with klal. <laughs> Okay, it's, so this started was, with Klal. Was Akudim, you didn't know yet uh, the future that it was going to say still, yes, yeah, call this, as call this, as call this. So just says, the that's the Vart, that's the Chiddush here. That Akudim is really the intro to Nakudim and Brudim. Just like here in the Psukim, the Klal is the intro to the Prat. Now, why do you talk have to have Klal, Prat, to Klal? You could have had Prat and Klal. Or, Klal and Prat. or just Klal and Prat. Okay. Okay, so we'll see. This is Dvarim Dakim. But the Nekudah, we'll, we'll get to that. But the Nekudah we have to understand here is what's Klal here? Taking the Pratim and finding their common denominator. And when you find their common denominator, you'll be able to make more. Because if you don't find their common denominator, you have to stick to the Prat. If you find the common denominator, you can go back to the Klal. <coughs> what is Akudim then? That's Akudim. Akudim is, we take all the Pratim of Ishtashalus and we say, what's their Klal? What's their common goal? What's their common source? And I say, they have one mother. They have Ein Saif. And I bring them back to that space. And when I bring them back to that space, there's no differentiation. Like the seed. The seed includes the toenails, and it includes the brain. Now, you're not going to compare toenails to a brain. We all know that if you cut toenails, it's a good thing. If you cut a brain, it's not such a good thing. Right? Would the doctor agree? It's not such a good thing. And yet in the seed... There's achtos. There's no differentiation. Is there really no differentiation? I mean, I'm just giving a muscle. You can't compare a seed to a kudum because a seed is a physical thing with, with physical properties and under the microscope, etc. But I'm just giving a muscle where the differentiation is less felt. It's less nirgish. That's one akud. 
He says, Avul Pi. Ah? Talking about it is the state of Mashiach. Avul Pi is Shabbos, but Shabbos. What's Shabbos? <laughs> so now here comes words. Hu Aliyah Sa Yishtalshalus. It's the elevation of Ishtalshalus, meaning. Hishtalshalus is the whole structure of the universes. Lepchines makif haklali. To what's called makif haklali. Lepchines atzmus ein soif. To the core of the ein soif. Asher loy shayich boy loy mar shuhu mokar uklala shayich lishtalshalus. You can't say on him that he's a source and a klal that is relatable to the pratim of Hishtalshalus. Mitzat shehu bebchines ein soif v'yachalias riboy revavis ha'ishtal shalos ba'ifanem achedim. You can't say that because he's ein soif, therefore he's a mucker for ishtal shalos. In fact, there could have been myriads of other forms of ishtal shalos. Who even knows if these midas had to come out? Could have been myriads of other types of midas that came out. This is not a klal of these pratim. This is a completely abstract call. When this is revealed, it's also in the same style. What comes out is the mucker hakloli, the absolute mucker, the mucker even of klal. And the best way to define it is, he says, it's pashat betachas abshitas, meaning it cannot be defined in any way, not even as a klal for pratim. So we said yesterday in terms of what pshitas really means. We're re- redefining it. Yesterday's definition of pshitas is no longer what real pshitas is. Right. Because yesterday we thought. Okay. Right. What do you mean? Which different? What? What do you? Because yesterday it? we thought that what we what we're calling now akudim as opposed to beyond akudim. Right. We, you know, what we we call that yesterday. The yes. Real the emissive, and it's important to understand. Legabi nekudim and brudim akudim is pshitas. No question. Legabi shabbos akudim is not pshitas. It's relative. Yes. Relative is a fine word. What's not relative? Relative. Yeah. Yeah, Emma's. <laughs> so, but, but sh- maybe I'm pretty sure of the question, but if this is what where Shabbos is going to be, above Akudim, and the days of the week are below Akudim, so I understand if you go up one step from the days of the week from Shabbos, so you're going from, you know, to and Tikkun, you're going up to Akudim. But now you're going to say you're going to go from the days of the week, skip Akudim altogether, and the next step from the days of the week is oh, going to be something... That's where Lechem Mishnah is going to come in. The whole Maimah started Lahav and Inyan Lechem Mishnah, and the Machloik is between Nigla and Nister. That's the Machloik is we're going to be dealing with. What is Lechem Mishnah on Shabbos? What's this whole idea of Lechem Mishnah? That leap... And remember, Lechem Mishnah is Lechem, in, we, we're eating Lechem in Aretz, it's commemorating the man, which is Lechem in Hashemayim, and it's, that's, how we, that's how we welcome all the three meals of Shabbos. Okay. Now I want to read with you this parenthesis. Now, I'm just telling you, this parenthesis is extremely, extremely abstract, as these words are. But what's so interesting about this parenthesis is, as far as I know, it's the only place you'll have it in Torah Ur, the writer of the Maimer, which was not the Balatanya, was his brother. His brother's name was Rabbi Yehuda Leib. He's known as the Maharil, Moireinu Arav Rabbi Yehuda Leib. Or a sefer called She'eris Yehuda in Allah. He was a big gun. He was a brother of the Balatanya. He wrote his Maimar. He was one of his writers of his Maimarim. These Maimarim, every Shabbos and Yom Tif that he said, were not written by him himself. He wrote the Tanya and the Shulchan Aruch, but the Maimarim he didn't write. Many of, some of them he looked at to agree upon them. But his brother wrote them. His brother wrote them pretty accurately how he said. He spoke in Yiddish, but he wrote them pretty accurately. But here his brother puts in a parenthesis. And he signs his name at the end of the parenthesis. You'll see he says, Maril. Maril, Marino Arav Or whoever, the Tzemachzadik printed this, could be he put in his name to say that it was from him. In other words, Zayda didn't say these words. But look at his words. He says, Umitam ze'atzmai shuhu makr klali betachlus b'pchina sein saif. And because of this, that he is the ultimate source, completely in Ain Soif, you have to say that all of Ishtalshalus, which is there, is there because of his perfection, not because he is a source. 
It's all there, even in this space. But it's not because he's a kalal. It's not that he's a mukit. It's not that he's a mother. He's not a father. And therefore, when you're speaking about this space, you can't say that hishtalshulus is a prat legabe klal. Kikol klal hu shayich la pratim. Because the klal is, every klal relates to the pratim. Rak mashen echlolim boya hishtalshulus hu dover shememele. Mepne shehu shleim musa de kula. The reason hishtalshulus is all included in this ultimate source is bederich memele. It's not that he's a klal for it. It's because he's the ultimate perfection, so everything is there. Vuhu rak bebchine ziv ha'ara. The way to define the protim in this klal is not like protim in a klal, but like the ray, like the ray, the ray of a sun. Just like light, which is almost a natural revelation from the sun, the sun doesn't work on generating light. There's a sun, so light comes out. The same is true, the oir, spiritually, is only a gilim and that's why it's only a ray, maharil. In other words, don't think that in this first source you don't have all the details. You also have all the details. But it's not like in Akudim. In Akudim, it's a Klal. And even though the Klal is completely beyond the Pratim, but nonetheless, Klal is always Shaykh la Pratim. Here you can't even call it a Makar, you can't even call it a source, even though it is. <laughs> Everything is there. All details are there, but you can't call it a Makar, you can't call it a Klal. Because if you're calling it a Klal, what does it mean? It means that it's ultimately the father, the prototype, the source of the protim. It's tracing back the protim to their source. And here, you're not tracing the protim back to their source. You're talking about a source that is completely undefined by any details, but because it's completely undefined, so therefore it's also not defined by the fact that it has to be undefined. So therefore, all details are there. But it's not about a definition of what it is. In fact, it's about a lack of definition. Nobody knows what I'm talking about. It's fine. Don't worry. I also don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> that was your question. No? Okay. Okay. We'll stop here. Ezer Hashem. Tomorrow there's no shear. This class is brought to you by the yeshiva.net. Please help us continue the classes. Make even a small contribution at www.theyeshiva.net slash donate.